everyone. Welcome to the, uh, the meeting of the Parks, Recreation, Human Services, and Public Safety Committee. And it is six, uh, 5 o'clock, actually 5.01, so calling the meeting to order. Um, first off, do we have any public comment? We do. We have Karen Brigado, and she's speaking on behalf of the Arts Commission, so she has five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, oh uh, first, Karen, first before, uh, first I should recognize that we have uh, Lydia Sefa Dawson on the committee and Erica Norton uh, on the committee is online with us right now. And we are joined by, uh, by Council President Kochmar and coming up right now is Deputy Mayor Honda. So thank you for being here. All right, Karen. Good evening, um, Parks, Rec, Human Resources, Public Safety Committee members, <laughs> and uh, City Councilman. <clears throat> I am Karen Brigado. I'm a 30-year resident, and I'm um, I am speaking for the Arts Commission today. Um, I am speaking about the um, the 2022 one-time COVID unmet needs funding that you received from King County. This money is reserved for the PAC. That's what it says, reserved for the PAC to support arts and culture programs and operations during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I was delighted to hear that the last uh, meeting of this group, that um, when um, Ms. Honda introduced the, the uh, suggestion that it could go to the performing arts groups, the resident arts groups, that um, Staff Hutton answered that it was possible that's possible <laughs> of course he has another idea for it too and that's where the dilemma comes into is which one do you choose um, i speak on behalf of all of the resident arts groups here today five years ago when the pac was first built um, we recognized all of the arts groups did that it would be expensive they geared back their um, their spending uh, to make that possible and of course then the pandemic hit Three of the resident arts groups at that point, they didn't have FTEs of any kind, so they were not possible. It wasn't possible to have the Payroll Protection Act uh, enacted. They didn't have um, any private grants. They had no private foundations. Um, and during COVID, um, they still had to fulfill the contracts for services that the Arts Commission requests, so they went, well, they provided us concerts on Zoom, on YouTube. Uh, and of course, that was to um, a very, very low audience and received no money there. So you have right now today, two of the five resident artists are not performing at the PAC. It's too expensive. Um, you have one resident artist that is, um, they're going to have one of their concerts outside, probably Bellevue. You have another artist group that is actively seeking another location that is cheaper to have their performances. So the situation is quite urgent for the resident artists. And they need help, and they come to the Arts Commission for this help. Um, the Arts Commission can't help them. We have 1990s dollars, and this is a 2023 problem, along with COVID. So I, I didn't know what to do. We interviewed these. Um, all the contracts for services and after I, I just had to cry because we just can't help them we can't help the resident artists so I did the only thing I could think of and that is to do a deep dive on the city of federal way public records to try to find anything for them any program any money that might come out through the city the county the state even federal dollars and that's where I ran across the 2022 one time COVID unmet needs funding. And it says right here in the funding itself, in the letter, the purpose of this funding is to support emergency assistance that will address unmet needs and or lost revenue relating to or resulting from COVID-19 pandemic. I propose uh, that this money go towards the all five resident arts groups. I have a table here with a weighted average based on the number of performances they gave prior to COVID. Um, it, I'm not gonna go through this, but it says the symphony, of course, would 
at that time gave six concerts. They would receive 23,000. Uh, the Youth Symphony gave three. They would get 11,500. The Corral would get um, almost 7,700, and the other two would get 3,850 based on a weighted average. So for these groups, of course, the ones that do not use the PAC at that time, it might be earmarked as restricted funds for them to use uh, later in the year as a, um, uh, for the PAC. So you're, you're hit with the dilemma. You can actually fund what the, um, what the parks wants uh, at the Arts for Youth that has been dormant for a couple years, or you can fund on an emergency basis the resident arts groups that are in at the PAC. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, does anyone have any questions for her? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I would just say I support what she's saying, I, okay. and, which I've supported before. Mm -hmm. So I, I would support that. Can okay. I ask a question then? Yeah, yes. Go ahead. Is that okay? Um, with the weighted, um, I know you used the um, number of number of um, concerts or shows mm -hmm. so one who who did the the um, study and the secondly are we only looking at the number of concerts Ooh. or the number of people also who could you know who, that they bring in the generate that they generate an audience so would that also be a factor to change some of the numbers well the arts commission has the number of concerts because we get we have contracts for services every year so we actually know the number of concerts the actual population of each concert it varies with each one um, usually Christmas is much more well attended than the others I just thought it was better to go off the number of concerts if you've got another idea of how to wait it that would be fine too it, it's just a mathematical yeah just adding another way yeah. of looking at it because that also matters um, yes. Attracting audience. So, thank you. True. Right. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Karen, thank you very mm -hmm. much. So, this uh, amount of money, the total amount of money you're talking about is how much? 50000 That's and, how much the grant is for. Okay. And um, are you going to be going through human services to, because m most of this money, the $3 million was sent to human services, 3.7, I believe. This is a separate one, and mm -hmm. it went directly to the mayor. Um, through um, King County. Um, I, I have it right here. <laughs> I have a copy right here. So it's a grant from the county to it's the It's a grant from the county. It's from PBR, uh, Pete Von Rickbauer's Yeah, I don't office. think we've discussed that mm -hmm. yes. at all. It doesn't go to Human Resources. It Actually, I think it went directly to the PAC. So... Um, no, it didn't. Oh, where does it yeah, go? Could, could we... Yeah. Uh, Autumn, can you shed some the light? The funding there? was... Um, the funding letter was received by King County to the Performing Arts and Events Center. Um, all of the funding goes directly through the City of Federal Way and is earmarked for the Performing Arts and Events Center. The okay. grant was $50,000 and it was approved to be accepted back in November, um, specifically November 19th at the council meeting, but it is earmarked for the 115 fund for the Performing Arts and Events Center through the city. Right. So does it work for what's been proposed? The specific grant is meant to, um, I can read you the specific grant detail right here. The purpose of this funding is to support emergency assistance that will address unmet needs and or lost revenue related to or resulting from COVID-19 pandemic on King County communities. And I do have a presentation coming up, um, I believe we're the second okay. item on the agenda that will give Great. you more information. Thanks. So, okay. yeah, I didn't want her to think that that was a possibility because it looks like it's already been um, dedicated to a certain uh, a man. But is that something that you might be able to apply for? Because we did have extra money that was going to go through human services. I don't know of any extra money. All I saw Well, the, the extra I money would have been from the um, uh, pandemic relief funds. Mm -hmm. And that was 3.7. So uh, you might want to talk to Sarah Bridgeford about whether you can apply through that. Okay. I just want to make sure that there's a, a way for you to receive some money without you thinking that there would be a possibility. Right, and I, I remember Mr. Dovey at the time that it was accepted saying let's accept the money and we could figure out where it goes later. Yeah. So that's why I thought I had some hope. Well, thank talk, you. Talk yeah. to Sarah and then, and, then, and then email both Susan and I and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Lydia, did you have something more? Um, yeah, I do want to hear what uh -oh. the, the presentation, but also if it went to the mayor, is this something we even discuss up here? 
Sure. It's, That's what it, I don't know. It's yeah. funding. Okay. Yeah. It was brought before the Parks Committee in November, and you guys right. discussed it, and then right. it went for consent on November right. 7th or 15th. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. So we've discussed when we uh, when it was voted to approve and accept the grant, we did discuss this proposal. Um, but I'd also say that we also discussed when we do budget amendments in um, February, March, when we find out you know what wasn't spent last year, that it's possible that we can have some funding left over um, to give to these groups also. Okay. Because it, we do need to support these performing groups so that they don't disappear. So yeah. under the, uh, the autumn or, or John, under the current budget, what, what specifically is that $50,000 targeted? Oh, oh you, you'll be presenting that later on. That's okay, that, that, that's fine, yeah. that's fine. And, and Karen, uh, what, what are the two other uh, groups that you did not mention by name? Uh, the two other groups, that I, all five are resident artists. Which two did you want me well, to Well, you, you mentioned the, uh, the symphony, the U Symphony, and the chorale. Uh, it would be Harmony Kings and the Jet City Chorus okay. that can no longer afford the pack. Okay, all right. right. Thank you. Thank you. And, oh, e Erica, uh, sorry about that. Erica, go it's ahead. okay. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I do support this because um, it would be uh, helping out several entities instead of just one and as a vocalist and someone who's spent most of my life on a stage <laughs> uh it it's really important that we have the arts and support the arts i don't think that we do that much in our city and um this would be an opportunity to show the resident artists that we care about them and want them to stick around i think it's important for kids to see people on stage performing and it's it's a whole nother music is a whole nother language that when you learn it it opens your mind's mind up to different possibilities um and different realms of existence i know that sounds like really weird but as a musician um and an artist i i think that it's important that we consider that and i remember voting for this in november and I'm, I'm fully supporting this. You know, it's, we're the council. We can change. So it's it's up to us. It just depends on you know, who wants to help them out. Okay. And and may I add to that that if nothing is done, you're looking at five going probably down to one. The optics are extremely poor. Uh, to give you a hint, the Rialto uh, Pantages Theater has eight resident arts groups. Can you imagine McCaw Hall without its symphony, um, uh, Benaroya without ballet? It, it's, it's an emergent situation. Okay. All right. Uh, Council President Coach Mark. Well, you know, uh, Autumn, I'm wondering, is, is there any kind of a, a special kind of funding that you can for our resident art groups that would be at a lower level, lower scale than outside arts groups using the PAC? During my presentation, I have a lot of information for all of you in regards to the current rental rates and multiple other avenues within the resident artist organization, so I look forward to sharing with that you. Good, that would be okay. Helpful. So Karen, who in, what, when are you making a presentation? I believe I'm the second item on your You're agenda the... tonight under PAC. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Karen. And I look forward to uh, your presentation, Autumn. Uh, do we have another? We have Janine Barber. All right. Janine, you are, you are on. Thank you. As one of the newer members of the Arts Commission, I'm <laughs> I came, I came to support the words that were going to be said today. And I also know how important music is as we're, plan as we're planning our next Make Music event and the Flapjacks at Jimmy Max fundraiser. We know what the funds are doing. We know that money is, is tight everywhere. And yet, I have a quick story for you. 
at our Make Music event when the Decatur High School Jazz Band stood up and started playing the U.S. Navy Jazz Band that came in from Silverton, Washington. Uh, they were all in their dress navy whites and ready to play. They joined the band. They joined one at a time, two at a time, and they played while the high school director continued to direct. Yes, music can do an awful lot, and I'm here to speak to that. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. I mean, I agree that, that music is essential. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a musician myself, and so, and sing one season many years ago with the Federway Chorale, and, and uh, but anyway, so, so thank you for your comments. All right. Uh, let's move on with the agenda. Item A, approval of the November 8, 2022 minutes. There's um, a correction, out, but I don't know what it is now. Hold on. There's a minor, minor, minor okay. thing I found, but give me one second. It's a date and it says 21-22. That's what I'm looking for. Oh, there. King County COVID-19 pandemic funding for PAC. It says the 21-22 King County budget. All right. That's it. You caught that, Mary? Where are you at? It's under King County COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, okay. It says 21-22. Oh, thank you. Good catch. All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, you have a motion to approve the minutes for that correction? Sure. I move to approve the minutes from November 8th, 2022 with... Second. No? With the amendment. Yeah. With the correction. With the correction. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 It is unanimous. All right, going on to... Uh, uh, item B, presentation on feasibility of a drug treatment program. We have several people from AU Consulting. And uh, if you'd go ahead and introduce yourselves, and we look forward to hearing from you. I guess I'll introduce ourselves before I put the screen up. Uh, good evening. I am Abby Cates and I have Abigail McDowell here with me. I'm going to get our presentation started. So just some housekeeping before we start. This presentation does contain intellectual property owned by my company, AU Consulting. RCW 9-1605 does define intellectual property. I do ask that you do not share, duplicate, or transmit this without my explicit consent. And if you have questions, please contact Lambino Martino Legal Office in Tacoma, Washington. And so with that, I am turning over to my business partner, Gail McDowell, for her to do her first part of the presentation. Is this quick? Yep, it's quick. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Um, we really do appreciate the time uh, to be here to present what we hope will um, move us forward. So um, according to U.S. Department 8 HUD, there are 52.2 homeless citizens per 10,000 people in King County. There are 13,000 368 experiencing homelessness, and of that, 4,947, 37%, identified as having substance abuse, substance use issue according to King County's point in time 2022 data. The national cost, the national average cost for homelessness is $40,000 per person per year. So that equates to approximately $535 million for King County for one year. And of that sub subpopulation of homeless substance users, the cost per year is approximately $198 million. From that data, we extrapolated the picture for Federal Way. So if the City of Federal Way 
doesn't implement a system that combats the confounding factors of mental health and substance abuse. The city's homeless people with substance abuse will continue to increase at the rate of 6.9% every year in addition to the 190 that is coming from Seattle. And it will cost approximately $29 million per year. The subpopulation of homeless with substance use is roughly 10,857. Huh? 10 million. I meant to say 10 million, not 10,000. <laughs> 10 million. So roughly $11 million per year. That, uh, for this presentation and, and our proposal, it is focusing for this subpopulation. Seeking human kindness. So in preparation for this proposal, I, um, I did some research and I came across the 2018 Federal Way Homeless Task Force. And I was very inspired because what I saw is that what we had envisioned is very much aligned to what you all envisioned back in 2018. We have the same mission, very aligned mission, which is to spread human kindness, not only to the homeless substance users, but also to the community of Federal Way. I um, pulled some quotes in there. We must do we must do all that we can to build an atmosphere of teamwork and trust. That's why we're here, to build trust, to help the city. Next. So how is this different? I mean, I, we've done some research in, in preparation for this and one of the key differences is our mission. Our mission is to create healthy, recovered, productive members of society. From what I've seen, other municipalities' method and mission is harm reduction, which is to prevent HIV, STIs, and Hep C. It's to prevent harm. But we see that in order to really make an impact to those numbers of almost 11 million 544 or 271 of that homeless substance users population, we need to address the confounding factors. So I will um, read another one from the, the task force. Truly effective and compassionate solutions must, must focus on eliminating or at least mitigating the root causes of homelessness for each individual served so that they can move forward on a path to ultimate goal of sustainable housing and stable lifestyle. We want the same and we want to show you how we can get there with our proposal. Besides our mission, we also have our project method is very different from what you've seen from most consultants. We do use a variation of what's called DMEDI, which is a Lean Six Sigma approach, but we also couple in change management and a lot of behavioral coaching. We've been in the business for over 25 years individually, um, over 80 years cumulatively, and what we've seen is that we really do need to also address the behaviors of those that we are working with. And so it's it's combining Lean Six Sigma DiMedi approach, change management, and behavioral coaching. The third that we want to talk about is we're here to connect and streamline existing providers in federal waste detox, rehab, and social services. There's a lot of good organizations that I've seen all with the same mission of providing human kindness and what we want to do is really leverage all the, the great things that people are doing and connect them and, and make a streamlined process. And I'll, I'll show that to you in a second. Another thing that's different from what we envision is identifying gaps and failure points from the homeless substance user's perspective. They are the heartbeat of the design of this program, of this system. I want to emphasize on the word system. We need to create this 
so that we know what will lead to them to their failure and design the system around that. We were discussing that when we get them off the streets, we don't have time. We need to address some of the inefficiencies in the system. They don't have time to wait, maybe two months we can get you in. So how do we do that? How do we transition them from off the streets to a productive member of society? We have a plan. Another thing that's different with this is job training integrated into the rehabilitation cycle. We are envisioning what was Erica saying? apprenticeships. You know, how do we leverage the economic needs right now? I hear it from places. We don't have enough people to hire. You know, how do we leverage different apprenticeships program, the trades? There's a lot of work, especially um, supporting the infrastructure bill. I mean, there, there is a lot of work. So how do we partner up with some of these um, organizations and companies that are providing that and get them in good, high paying jobs. These are very good jobs. And then last, um, at least for this page, is the peer navigator support throughout the entire life cycle. Um, I've never been an addict, but I have seen and I have family members and friends that have. And we need to support them from the streets all the way out. We need, to, they are rehabilitating their life. And so with the peer navigator is there to really support them throughout the entire life cycle. And what we're also doing is making sure that we get their perspe perspective. So I'm gonna go back to the identifying gaps and fail failure points. We have people on the team that are, that's been there and successful and are still active in recovery activities and making sure that we harness all those best practices and also what, what would make that individual fail. We want to make sure we design that into the system so that we have a higher success rate. And then another thing that's different is there's this clinic that I found. Um, you all have a copy of that. It's called Zion Healing. And this is just one. I, I want to emphasize that this is just one of the things amongst, in addition to what I just talked about is um, the clinic uses best practice modalities, so there's four modalities that they use to revitalize and retrain the brain to function as it was originally designed. The, there's two technology that they use. You have um, a copy of that. It's called TMS and QEEG. And it's approved technology since 2008. It's been um, used over four million times. It is covered by insurance. And what it does, essentially, it reawakens the brain, it restores the brain's chemistry balance through neural stimulation, neurofeedback, brain mapping, and so essentially it's physical therapy of the brain. In addition to those two technology there, um, the clinic also emphasized on one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions and group therapy. Um, the group therapy involves leveraging and using the 12-step program within there. And also, one of the things that they do is they do have um, videos um, that so that the participant is already starting to use and learn life skills while they're there. So, it's so, so going back to the confounding factors, right? It was mental health and substance abuse. But if you actually look at some of the other reasons um, they talked about are job loss, and so they really, the clinic really designed this in a way that you hit multiple at the same time, which is, I would imagine, why they're successful of having a success rate of 62% vice to 10. So I keep saying life cycle, so what is that? So our, what we're proposing is the life cycle of the homeless substance users to productive citizen. We are starting all the way, starting from off the street, which is recruitment, and at the very end is assistance in permanent housing with a job. So what we 
design is, this is an estimate, is that it's going to take 142 days, assuming there is no delays in between, and that's what we need to design it for, 142 days. And as you can see here, if you look at 84, that's the number of days it'll take to be in the, in the rehab program. It's 12 weeks. So that is the system constraint. That's the longest leg. But, that is, we, need, but we need to make sure that we get as many people through that, through that program. And I'll show you why. So I did a study, quick capacity study. So what would, what would it take to bring down the 271 homeless substance users? And so if we say with the way things are, um, current state one shift, you can see that's the gray box right there. It'll be upwards there of above 500 and more like what? Well, you could just see it's increasing. One clinic, one shift. So if we had those one clinic, one shift, we would just make sure that we don't grow. So the 16.9% increase, we, it'll barely grow. But what we really want to show is that if we invest in, if we do one clinic, two shifts, you could see that it goes down. As well as we do two clinics, four shifts, you see a dramatic burn down of that homeless substance users. So I, we have two courses of action to make an impact with that homeless sub population here. It's either we have one clinic, two shifts, and I wanna say that this is in addition to everything else within the system because even if we just have the clinics, you will still have the inefficiencies from recruitment all the way till they are fully functioning citizen. So I do want to emphasize that because I've talked to several people and they're like, oh, just get a clinic. No. I will tell you that's not going to work. We need to do the whole system. So for course, course of action one is we have one, one clinic, two shifts, and you will see that it, um, 2034 is when we'll see the population go down. Um, we did the math, and I'll let Abby talk about that later, but the, the payback period for that, for the investment, is we'll get it back in five years. Um, the other and better option, because I, I believe we need to be aggressive with this, because there are other com confounding factors. We already know that people are talking about the recession and the impact and job loss. And so the added stress on that, and I've seen some of the data, and that was one of the other issues that people brought up, is that may increase. So we need to get ahead of this subpopulation because the other homeless subpopulation may, may increase. But what you can see here is that uh, by year 2028, we would have made an impact on the homeless substance user population, and your payback period will be three years. I want to go back to okay, sorry. there's something I want to talk about on this slide uh, when you look at either the yellow line or the green line and you see that they're starting to downward trend and we know that we're having a notable impact on the niche population of this particular system the homeless substance users that opens up capacity in these clinics this clinic is not just for homeless substance abusers we know that across the state mental health is an issue and so this clinic is also geared to support mental health support, to support those with mental health needs outside of the niche market that we're talking about. So we really have an opportunity here to have another impact on the community outside of this. So when uh, you see these numbers go negative, don't think that the clinics aren't going to be operational because they absolutely are. These are. This is a therapy that can be supportive with the other therapies that currently exist, just like they use it as an additional modality. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention, that the negative number doesn't mean no use. Um, I just wanted to read a couple things from the task force 
Services are different, are difficult to navigate for a person experiencing homelessness. So we will design that for you so that it's simple, streamlined. Another one from the, the study, uh, from the paper. Specifically, the cycle of homelessness continues because some of its root causes such as addiction and untreated mental illness is not addressed. And so I just wanted to show you all that what we created prior to me reading that um, is very much in alignment to what you all have been thinking since 2018. And so um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Abby to continue on. Let's talk about the project timeline. Uh, I'm gonna start at the top of the slide and work my way down. This is the Demetti principle that Gail discussed, design, measure, explore, develop, and implement. Those are the five different phases. For all intents and purposes, the design phase, a proposal, that's what we're discussing right now. Uh, the measure, explore, and develop phase, like many complex, confounded projects, this diagram is very simplistic and indicates that they happen just in series. That's not true. This is an iterative process where we're, where we're measuring, exploring, and developing all at once. And based on what we learn in that cycle, we put all of those pieces together before we go into the implement phase. And the implement phase is when we are ready to go, the entire system has been created, and the doors are open for those first, we're gonna call it cohort, that first group of homeless substance users to leave the encampments, to enter detox, to start in this process of the life cycle, coming out the end as a productive citizen. And you'll see that we, the timeline that we've put in there, our goal is that by June of this year, we would have the measure, explore, and develop phases complete with the system design complete, so we're able to start moving forward with the implementation of the actual healing process. You'll see that the date is December of 24, uh, and Gail talked about how it was a 12-week process. Well, what's really important to us is we have three cohorts going through in that first year, and we also want to understand after they've come out of the program, what does it look like for them as members of society? So we're not going to be just letting these people go and giving them no more attention. We're gonna maintain that relationship and understand from them what do we need to do to improve this system, which I'm gonna talk about more at the end. Uh, and I'm also gonna just allude to it now, the funding portions. We have three distinct areas of funding that we're looking at. $100,000 from the opioid settlement, sponsorships, and grants. And I'm gonna talk in detail right now about that $100,000 opioid settlement. What does that cover? Because that's the piece that really gets this project moving. Gail referenced the failure modes effects analysis. And what that does for us is that takes the us, gives us the ability to look from the homeless substance user's perspective and say what are all the areas in this system that they may not be successful. We are intentionally analyzing all of the failures in the system. That is going to allow us to not only understand the failures in the system, but also address the community and the stakeholder concerns. When we pull all of that information together, we can create a comprehensive risk mitigation plan. That risk mitigation plan is what designs the system. So we know that there are inefficiencies in the system because of the research that you guys have already done, the documentation that's out there. So we wanna take that existing documentation, go re-engage with these stakeholders and say, hey, this is what we've learned. How do we bring all of these things together now to create that high level system? What are those community connections? How do all those community connections play out so we can create and populate a timeline that's detailed and finite so we can move toward implementation in a very intentional manner so it's not something that we're just trying to go do. So everyone's very clear on how we're doing it and what's being done. And really the key to all of this, especially in that failure mode effects analysis, is the peer navigators. I'm gonna use the word heartbeat, the heartbeat of the system. These are the folks that have made this transformation in their own lives. And they are the ones that are holding the hands of the folks that are just starting this process. So engaging the peer navigators early, having them help us determine where are all these potential places we could have failure and design the system to be successful in mitigating all of those risks. 
along with that um, risk analysis plan that's happening, we're also going to be looking at the system design. Where are the current gaps? What are those community connections telling us need to change? How do we take advantage of the opportunities that they have and that they know the things because they do every day? And we're going to remediate those and make sure that in that system design, we've also addressed the concerns that they have. And of course, there's the absolutely paramount notion of measurements and how do we know we're moving forward in a manner that's in alignment with not only the city but the community and the homeless how do we make sure that this system is being developed what KPIs can be put in place to keep everyone in system design accountable and the piece that moves us from the hundred thousand dollars on to the rest of the project is the grants and the sponsorships so let's talk grants and sponsorships. We've got grant writers that we are engaging with and folks that are working on marketing to get sponsorships so we can make sure that this transition happens as seamlessly as possible. From a total project cost, we're looking at about $4.1 million is the rough high level estimate that we have done this far based on the information we have available to us. The clinic cost, if it runs at two shifts, just one clinic, is about $1.2 million for the first year. That includes purchase and everything, so that number does decrease in future years. Two shifts, each at two clinics, looks at about $1.9 million. And just to give you guys some ideas on how these numbers were developed, uh, staff, peer navigators, clinic managers, team leads, we have some idea of what those salaries are right now in the community and that word heartbeat. This project really is leveraged on the fact that those people are so important and we want to honor the work that they do by going into the encampments. We really want to pay them well. We, want and we know that this is essential, for, that their work is essential in this. So we're going to make sure this system has been developed with them at $30 an hour wage. Uh, we've rolled rent into this, some just gross estimates to get that operational cost. Project team, uh, I'm going to go into details about who the project team is. I do have other project team members here tonight. But longitudinal study, lessons learned, and system changes are really, so we have the design that we go through. That's just the first part. Once we come out of that cohort going in, we see huge potential here for Federal Way to start a longitudinal study that shows the successes of what has happened and how it can be applied to other parts of the county. Because we see that 62% number and we know that the impact can be extrapolated to other parts of King County, other parts of Washington State. Uh, I also want to be clear that the project team cost of $2.2 million is finite. So when that, when our portion is complete, we back out, we turn it over to the city. Um, one of the things that we specialize in with that process improvement world is documentation and standards and capturing how things are done. So everything would be created in a partnership. So it's very clear who is doing what and how that transition occurs because the ultimate success of this lies with the long-term run and understanding what that impact is. So talking to the substance users that have come out of the system, what changes do we need to make to the system? How do we make sure long-term before we go ask this to be implemented somewhere else that we have incorporated all of those changes? Uh, we do have some ideas for grants and sponsorships right now that are actively being worked in the background. Um, the difference between a grant and a sponsorship Grants, if you've ever been in the grant writing world, can take a really long time and every grant has the opportunity to ask you an entirely different set of criteria. So what you do for one grant doesn't necessarily roll over for the other grant. So each of those requires a great number, a great deal of work. Sponsorships, on the other hand, allow for a more immediate amount of money to come in the door. And so we're looking at creating sponsorship flow first while the grants are being written and applied for because sometimes they take nine months to a year to come to fruition. So this is some of the ideas that we're working on right now behind the scene to get um, the money rolling in. And I wanna take an opportunity from the system and process design engineering perspective. There's four of us with this over the course of our, uh, 
Our colleague Joe Mays here has been doing this for 40 years. Others of us have been doing it for 25 years. We've got hundreds, 100 years of experience in our work across our careers. We have seen a tangible savings of about $800 million, the projects that we've, work, that we've worked on. Um, almost all of our experience is in government. Uh, we also have an incredible group of folks in the social and medical services. We have people that are military in military health care right now. They're, in, they're social workers right now. Um, people with high school English degrees that taught and understand how to interact with students with adult learning, uh, FBI background. The team is incredibly, has an incredible depth of experience. We've done that really intentionally because we know that everyone's different perspective is what builds a strong system and being able to build the system strong from the start and support the work that you guys have already started is how we really make this an entirely successful project. Um, but really what it comes down to is our team members, and we have Luke Jones here tonight, part of the heartbeat of our team, those that have been through the recovery and the rehabilitation process, those that can speak at a very real level of what this means to have their life impacted greatly. And so those folks, um, incredible changes in their lives, incredible business people, and models for what this program can create. So with that, I open any questions you may have. And thank right. you for your time this evening. Okay. Uh, Lydia, let's start with you for questions then. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for your presentation, and I actually love how you framed it around kindness, serving people with kindness, and I think that's what we're all about tonight, and I really appreciate the compassion to, the, to do this project, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have several questions, and I also stand correct. Um, I, I do want to be corrected, but one question I have, um, one of the questions is, um, when you were talking about, what was it? Oh, 37% um, identified as having substance use issue according to King County's point in time data. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't realize they did interviews during that point in time um, data collection or when they did that, so. I, I just, I took their data, so what they did was they used statistics, so they took the 2020 point of use data, and that they, they did um, engage people, and what they did so that they don't, so that they were done, I believe, by June of 2022, is they applied statistical analysis to extrapolate the, the number, which is 37%. So that's how those numbers were derived. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking at Sarah for... Um, That's what I remember reading from the... Okay. All right. Thank you. And then my other question is, as we go along, um, if you look at the capacity study... Yeah, yeah. So in your proposal, you have, if we did one clinic, two shifts, and then two clinic, two shifts, but on that um, graph, I don't see two clinic, two shifts. Oh, it's there. It's green. Green is two clinic, four shifts. Same. Same? Same, same. It's each clinic, two shifts. Yes. Each clinic. That's what. Okay. Yes. Great. And then um, I'm going to have more questions after I hear. The, one more thing is when you, where you listed all the grants, um, are you also talking to or looking at SAMHSA grants or SAMHSA funding, which is substance abuse, mental health? As we've been talking, uh, one of our team members is in military health care right now, and he and I met earlier this week, and one of the things he suggested was looking at grants like that, looking at VA grants. So they're not on this list, but they are in our, uh, kind of our, our knowledge bank, but I would love any specifics you have to offer us. Okay, that could be something that would, I appreciate be, that, that. That would be very helpful for you, you, but I do have more questions, but I will um, ask later if they're not asked by other people. All right. Um, I don't see others, so I'll, I'll ask a few questions. Uh, 
first off, the, the, the 62% success rate, mm -hmm. where, where do we get that number from? I got that straight from the, the clinic, okay. from the, the Zion, uh, Zion Healing. So you have a, a piece of, I put an insert there that has the information and they talk about okay. that. Yep. All right, and, and with that, where, um, uh, what municipalities or, or whatever, what uh, currently the, the Zion Healing, so uh, I've tell, tell us a little bit about them. I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the statistics and everything and, yep. and uh, the overall plan, but, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about the, you know, the, the, the boots on the ground. I mean, how do we actually make this function? And, and how do we, uh, you know, I mean, okay. well, we, we, we can make statistics show anything yeah. almost. I mean, I, I, want to, I want to see how it actually works. So, so from speaking to them, um, currently right now there's about 45 clinics that's being launched this year. So it is, they've been functioning for over 10 years and they realize in order to scale and make an impact, they opened the franchise this year and currently there is none in Washington, but they are in Florida, New York, California, Utah. And I forgot the other place. No, it's okay. Yeah. Um, as far as how it specifically works, what I've, but just from talking to them, is that it is, how they approach this is that they are targeting the mental health and then knowing and then watching the impact with the substance abuse. And then they also have specifically, once they have assessed you, they have an, um, the IOP, which is 12 weeks, that they run you through and it's four hours long so you're there and so they do the the TMS first and then I can't tell if they do the neurofeedback right away that I don't know the specific but they are there four hours and within there they do the I believe it's 35 sessions for that and um, but within there they map your brain to see that it's making a difference and then they do one-on-one, -on -one. I don't know the specific of how, the quantity of the one-on-one -on -one counseling. And then they also have the, the group session within there. Okay. And, and how do we, how is the, the recruitment or the enticement or whatever, I mean, what, what is the motivation for the homeless drug addict? What is the motivation for them? I mean, they're, they, you know, a lot of them are very, unbelievable to me but that they're, they're comfortable with their lifestyle mm -hmm. and and they're set in their lifestyle and people human nature the very nature but people don't like change even jack, if it's good for them can i answer that jack okay um so most of the people that i know who live in camps in federal way they come down here because it's safe it's much more safe than seattle and just knowing that at least my one of my friends who knows that there are going to be close to 200 people being shipped from Seattle, and it's just men. These are only men that are coming here. Um, they're scared to death. So to be given an opportunity to get out of there and get your life straight before those people are shipped here, um, potentially more violence, more problems um you know like i don't know if you know who gnarly charlie is but he he lives outside and he likes it but he doesn't want to be living out there anymore if he knows that there's a bunch of guys from seattle coming here so that could be one of the things and our peer navigators who are not here at this time but they're really good at reaching out and being one-on-one -on -one with people um i think Drug addicts and non-drug addicts, there's just something about, we just get each other. So it's a lot easier for us to interact with one another, um, even, if we, even if we've got 16 years of recovery like me. Um, the problem is guaranteeing them that there's somewhere for them to be when they're done and that they're gonna have a future because normally rehab sticks you somewhere for 30 days and then they kick you out and then you've got nothing and you're back on the streets. 
I think letting them know that there's a possibility of reconciliation with their family at the end, that's, a, that's something that um, Abby and, and Gail did not talk about tonight, but that's part of the program. There's lots of things that we can give them and offer them like good jobs, permanent housing. Um, these are things that we will research and make sure that we, well, actually I probably won't be involved with it anymore after tonight. But these are things that the team will be taking care of. Um, and, and I just, I wish you could talk to uh, one of the peer navigators because this is just what they do for a living. And they recruit, each person recruits right now, five to 10 people a week to go to detox. This is just what they do for a living. So I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot easier to get people to come off the streets than you think. If we have something viable for them that they know what the end is, I don't know if that makes any sense, but telling somebody that they're going to stick, stick in a 30 day uh, rehab and boot you right back out on the street with nothing to, nothing to look forward to. Um, but homelessness and job joblessness is not a good approach. And that's all we've got right now. If we've got something that will offer someone a future, like, job training, work, uh, work, jobs that offer medical benefits and um, retirement, you know, in the trades, that's also going to entice them. Um, <coughs> question with this 62% figure, it's 62% uh, success rate. Is that 62% of them actually have at the end have jobs and and stable housing and everything, or is that 62% are, are off drugs, or, or what's, what's the, what, what is That's, the? That 62% is them recovering, not doing drugs, and they are able to have, start having a stability. So if I go back to what the, um, the task force is creating, first we gotta heal, heal them and get them stable so that they can, get the job, get the training, and, and being a full productive member of society. But the 62% is the success rate from their rehabilitation. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I think that one thing that's, that's be really critical, I mean, if, if we're to, to consider going forward to, with this, yep. I, I think that we need to hear uh, at some future time here uh, directly from somebody from, uh, from the Zion Healing Center. Oh, uh and, and, you know, get a little more uh, understanding of that and rather than just the, how the, the uh, you know, how, how this, how, how the whole, a anyway, uh, we, we, we need to have a, a better, better understanding of it. So, uh, Linda. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so, Erica, jump in if there's anything you think you can add to what my questions are. So I'm trying to understand the whole program um, and who you are, uh, really. Um, so my understanding is the program you're talking about, these clinics are a franchise that is out of state, correct? These clinics are a franchise coming they, from out of state? They were from out of state, but they are being implemented throughout California, New York, Florida. Yeah, but out of the state of Washington. Yes. Yeah, okay, so, so there, you don't have any clinics of this nature currently residing in the state of Washington. So are, are you, and what am I getting at is, are you looking at making Federal Way like a pilot program for implementing your plan? Yes. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Thanks. And so, um, so, so getting to the base facts of all that, mm -hmm. you know, before we can refer anybody to anything, we have to have a building that they can go to. Mm -hmm. And so how do we, we don't have any money, so, and I know that you're looking at grants, so I'm wondering how we, I mean, before you put the cart before the horse, I mean, everything's, by the way, if we only had 271 homeless with substance abuse people in the city, I'd be amazed it was only 271, but uh, I, I, I don't know that for a fact. But, uh, you know, um, I, I do believe what you're saying is something that could work, but I'm just wondering how we would make it work. And so there's some way we can implement, as you know, as you've heard, we're a city of 105,000 people. We're not like King County. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would seem to me that you would really get 
if you could get King County to let you agree to work with some of their um, buildings that they're buying to house people in that aren't being treated, your program would work very well in those programs where not in those houses. For us, it's the Red Lion and it's the um, extended stay motels. Would work very well within those confines of those buildings, but we don't have a building to refer you to. That, that's my point. One of our team members is a real estate agent, and we, on the way over, we were talking about the potential of using one of those hotels that was being converted. And so that's part of, when we looked at the project phases, the explore phase and the develop phase, that's what happens there, is we really work through all of those areas that need to be explored and put a plan in place to make them happen. Well, we would certainly love you to go talk to King County and Leo <laughs> and explain to them this is exactly what we'd like to see in the extended stay, for example. I'm happy to make phone calls. <laughs> all right. Uh, Lydia, do you yes. have more questions? Yeah, it's the projector system cost. Can you tell me, like you have total cost is 4.1 4 million, and then there's other numbers in here, uh -huh. so it's really not 4.1 million, then, no, correct? No, it is. The, when we add the worst case of the 2.2 .2 for the project team, unless I had bad math, and the 1.9 for the two shifts, two, um, okay. two shifts, two clinics, two shifts, add those together. And I added all three. Okay, that there answers the yeah, question. Because okay. we'll choose one or the other. We'll either choose one clinic with two shifts or two clinics with two shifts. With two shifts. Okay. Yeah. Oh, plus the peer navigators, though. That's not included in there. We incorporate those into the cost of the clinic. The clinic. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Susan? So when, when you're talking about two clinics and you're talking about two buildings, not necessarily. It depends, like, what the building is, what its shape is, where it can be. There's a lot of exploring that needs to be done there to understand that. Each, each cohort can only take eight to 10 people per class. So what we're talking about is each shift would be eight to 10 people. So at the most, it would be 40 people at a time going through the process. And, and that's why if we could get a location where we could um, where we could support that amount of people at once, then that would work. Um, but the thing is, is these classes are only designed for the treatment process. Just that part of the treatment process is only designed for eight to 10 people and you can't go over that amount. Um, I guess otherwise it doesn't work. I, uh, yeah, okay. So, um, thank you. So there'd be eight to 10 people, maybe two to four groups of eight to 10 people, maybe in one building. So when, when would you take your first client in? Is that, at the end, is that in December of 2024? No, our goal is to have that ready this summer to take the first cohort in. So then you need to get a franchise from Zion yeah, their, Healing Center? Their deployment is 90 days. So from when you, you talk to them and you have the funding, so outside of what you have to do, once you have the funding and you engage them, their, their deployment is 90 days. And we're looking at a private funder for that, so that money would be, the initial setup cost would be outside the scope, so we can make that happen very quickly. But the client themselves needs to have some type of insurance to pay for this? It's covered. And that's, that's one of the things that they have figured out and what I'm realizing that is part of their proprietary is they have figured out a way so that it can be um, covered by insurance. 95% of it is covered by insurance, Med, um, Medicare. And that includes the treatment with the um, what do they call it, the trans, uh, yes. transcranial magnetic stimulation? Yes. And Susan, we can get people signed up and on the Medicaid in less than 24 hours. We can do that when they're in detox. So the most of the payment's gonna be going, most of the money is going to the staff and the building and detox. That's 
pretty much where all the money is going to be. Medicaid will be paying for the treatment, and we're hoping that uh, King County Housing Authority and other organizations um, would help mitigate the costs of housing, uh, clothing, toiletries, that kind of thing. I mean, we've got this. The prices are of everything are pretty much mapped out down to toothbrushes at this point. But um, that's the the purpose of the explore phase is to understand and um, basically have have contracts ready to go uh, for the presentation and, and so that we can get it get the thing going. Sorry, I, I'm That's not okay. using proper verbiage here. So does a physician um, is a physician required to do the TMS? So that's one of that's part of the franchise is they 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 do everything they'll hire the physician because they protect their process and so they have a heavy hand on the selection of the physician and they do all the training um, they do everything it's turnkey so they would provide the physician and the mental health um, therapist they yes that's part of their their whole package Go ahead. So, Thank you. So that the people would be uh, be housed during this period then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the 12 weeks. For, yes. for the, yes. okay. Yes. All right. Uh, so I, I guess that uh, any other any other questions? Yeah. I, I, one thing that, that I'd say, I mean, I kind of, where, where do we go from here? Uh, you know, like I say, I think that we need to have somebody from from Zion Health Clinic mm -hmm. here speaking to us, and and getting okay. some more more specifics on on that end of things, and and then we can take a look and and you know we, we can talk to our our you know Sarah and, and other city staff here and 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 get input other input, and see just what we want to do. Uh, overall, I mean, I, I, I love the, I, I love the concept. I mean, there, there's obviously a great need, and and it needs to be treated with compassion, and you know that I, I love the, the human factor in here, uh, but we need to make sure that it actually works as well, and and if it can can actually work, I mean, I, I, I think it's fantastic, but we need to to make sure that it can actually. Uh, can actually work for us here. Jack? Yes. So are you saying that you want to speak to somebody from Zion before we can move on to giving presentation to the city council? Because I wanted to make a motion to um, let these ladies give a presentation to city council and get that money allocated before it gets eaten up by some other department in the in city hall uh i mean it would be possible to have have somebody from zion uh health as part of that presentation for the full council i don't know i'd have some one of they would have to call yeah. no i and i'm pretty sure they'd be willing to do a zoom meeting with you or you know with susan and linda or deputy mayor honda and council president Kochmar. Um, but I have not, I've, I've only emailed and I haven't asked for them to make any kind of public appearance. Can we do a, can we have a study session? Uh, With full to... council and also both, both entities. Would that work for you, Erica? Yes, if Zion Healing agrees to attend, yes. I think we need to hear from them too, though. I will yeah. contact them. Joe, would you like to add? My, one of my business partners would like to add. Microphone. Yeah. I know you were trying to stay away from the podium, <laughs> and you get exactly what you didn't want. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess one of the points I'd like to make is um, we're not selling Zion. If, if you look around our county, uh, I know our county is Kitsap. And I've looked around in Kitsap, and I know that all these technologies are actually being utilized today in Kitsap County. Zion, Zion has just put several different things together, all right? 
to call it their program. Just as we are now saying we have a higher enveloped program that takes it from beginning to end, where Zion takes it. That's why if you would have saw on the graph, it's right in the middle. It's just one of the steps. We realize that that's just one of the steps that needs to be performed. Zion doesn't do the, we have to recruit people or we have people out on the street that are looking so that when somebody has the need, it's time to bring them in when they're ready. They're not doing that. They're waiting for somebody to walk through the door. All we're doing is when we bring them in here, we're bringing people through the door because we're going to have a line. And then when they're done, they go out the door with a 62% rate um, of not relapsing. So that means they don't go back into their old life again. Well, they don't go into the further job training and everything that we're trying to also incorporate into this. So they're taking care of several of those confounded variables, but they're not covering them all. So what we want to do is we want to, that's what we're really selling is, how do we put all these programs together? One of the things that I've seen over the years is, Every time we start up a new program, you have a new person that's trying to win. So you have all these programs out there and they're trying to be the best and they're all good at what they do. But because they're only addressing one factor, they're never successful for the whole organization or the whole county in this case. They're only, we're going to buy a bunch of housing and it's going to put people in houses. And we're going to say, look, we put people in housing. But it's not going to address any of the crime or the drug addiction or the mental health that's going to occur. One of the things I ask these two on the way is, what do these people spend their money on? They're homeless. They're not spending their money on housing right now as it is. They're spending their money on other things. So anything they're doing to get that money is not going to change. That's the issue that we want to address. We can take that from beginning to end and put them back out on the street being productive. That's what's being sold. It's not Zion that's being sold here. And I, and I knew that it would get hung up that way too. That's what I was talking to them on the way. They're, everyone's going to say, I can just buy this. No, you can't just buy Zion. So what I'm hearing you say is you're partnering with Zion and housing entities probably and other yes. yes so to put this whole packet that cost about four million dollars yes is bringing in all these other yes. partners including zion and that's one I thing think. that yes okay got that's it that's one Thank thing you. i've been good at over the years is putting programs together and getting them to work together instead of trying to win individually so thank all you right. So. all right council president coach mark well so what i'm understanding then um Abby and Abigail, what it is you're looking for is the 100000 that we're getting for our opioid settlement to use that as your seed money to get this program moving. Is that what you're looking for? So okay. we can start yes. the analysis. Okay. Yes. And sure. And the, and the thing is, we, we don't have any money other than that. So what would be important for me, for example, would be understanding how the program could move forward. I mean, mm -hmm. who your partners would be to provide these um, different. You know, the funny thing is, I heard this on the radio today, honest to gosh. Matt Markovich, who was Como for our news reporter, is now going to be um, covering uh, the legislature. But he said, I mean, and I think this is horrible, that um, what people didn't know with the, the Seattle's um, Housing for the Homeless program, that what they were doing was behind the scenes was giving them tickets to go back to where they came from, for example, Kansas. So they get a ticket, an airplane or something, go back to Kansas, and then they take the train back to Seattle. Well, obviously, your program won't do that. Your program is something that we would be interested in. But have, as a backing as a government entity, mm -hmm. what would you be looking from us? Would you be looking from us to back your program so that you could get these grants, partnerships? Is that what you're looking for from the city? Because obviously, we don't have the money. But we could ask for the money from the legislature and the federal government. I think that's what one. we go ahead, Erica. Thank you. What we need from the city is to get these entities and these service providers to call us back and respond in a timely manner 
you know, because here's the thing. Do you know how many people I called at different times of the day over and over and over and over again, just to get a simple answer of how much does it cost to put someone through detox? How many days does it take to put someone through detox? Now, do you understand that, that the companies that are around here that are in Fife and Tacoma and the new one that's opening across the street from City Hall refuse to give me information? They wouldn't even talk to me. I said, I'm on the city council. It didn't matter. The, you know, and, and then they, they would refer me to their manager who wouldn't call me back. So how do you think it's gonna be for somebody who decides, you know what, I wanna get off drugs. I need to go to detox. If you can't even get these people to call you back, that's what we need from the city. We need the city to say, hey, you all need to work together. Here is a group of consultants who are putting a program together and yes, you're all gonna get a piece of the pie. You don't have to try to, to hog it all for yourselves. It's just a matter of getting these services streamlined and an agreement that they will have full cooperation, that this group of, that AU Consulting will have full cooperation from them and that they'll call back, simply call back. You know, I mean, it's it's very frustrating. You know, you know that that RI International across the street, I have tried, do you know, I've been trying to get in touch with that woman who's running it for close to a year. She has not returned any of my phone calls. And, and so I called their other uh, location in Fife and they refused to call me back. So, how can, you know, I think that if, if the city got together and said, hey, we need all of you here, we need to talk to you, that they would actually listen to the mayor. They would listen to the city council as a whole, but they're not going to, uh, if they won't respond to somebody who's on the city council, it's not gonna work out for the people who are on the street who need that help. <coughs> and so that's what the purpose of this is, is to get this, broken system working because it's not working if it was working we wouldn't have increased homelessness and drug addiction on our streets every year i have a thank you uh thank you uh deputy mayor honda um so you talked about that this isn't the zion health centers program you know it's a different but isn't that the difference between between what we have now for the the that it's not the difference it's part of the difference mm. it's not the entire difference the entire difference is that analysis of who out there are the providers how do we make sure that when someone works the peer navigator come off the street that they're transitioning smoothly from place to place that housing is available that detox beds are available that the partners in the community are working together collaboratively to support the person in the process not just to support their business so this is that's a part of it but it's not the entire system so the the brain mapping and the tms treatment is, it, is that already being done somewhere here? That's part of the Zion Healing Clinic. Right, I'm on their page. Are you asking if it's being done? Already? I know that it's being done in Kittat County and they're not, they're not calling themselves Zion. Okay. There are places that are doing TMS in this state. Okay. Okay, well, I was, I was just wondering why. Um... So the, I, I was to, let me, let me think about this. So if I go back to the confounding factors, so what they've done is. Can you talk make, into the mic, is that I'm okay? Sorry. What Thank they've you. done is make, they <laughs> designed their rehab program so that it does have the TMS and the neurofeedback, which is the QEEG, and, so I'm gonna keep saying and, and the one-on-one -on -one counseling, and the 12 step. So it's addressing it from multiple angles. So even though maybe there's some place that does the TMS, I can't tell you, but I was looking at 
um, their success rate, but I was looking at one clinic that they just do TMS, and they said that their success, at least just for treatment of depression, was was about roughly around 50 percent. So I was like, oh, okay, so there is a difference between adding the the neuro mapping, so because the neurofeedback shows it shows how the brain if it's responding, so that they can adjust, and also the whole one-on-one, -on -one, the, the, the talking through some of why they even got to where they're at. So even though you have the technology, there's that piece of really talking through that with somebody so that they can learn to, I mean, just, just the talking, to feel worthy. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, that was my question, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you, and thanks for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you so much. That's Council Member Seth Dawson. I have, you have a question, another question. Oh, you have a question. Oh, yeah. we're not I'm done. Sorry. So okay. based on what you just said, by the way, and I'm very, um, I love to learn and I, I love to understand how this works. Mm -hmm. So if possible, I would still love, if you're going to present to the full council and if that's what we're moving forward with, I would still love to have them come and present because understanding how that um, system works or you know would be something that would be very beneficial for us to also get a grasp on okay why it does what it does so it's not a matter it's i think it, it would be very helpful to us and to also our audience and our other people to really understand the difference between you know 50 percent to 62 percent is a huge mm -hmm. um gap so how do we get there and how does that how you know how does that work and maybe they're also talking about trauma informed type of stuff so i think understanding that would be very helpful at least for myself so if possible it'd be great to have when we want you to to present to the full council to also invite them and, and be part of that conversation would be what i would love to see all right okay. and thank you. mayor honda has another question thank you I, I know uh, in the very beginning you said not to copy this, but every council member would need a copy. And could we do? Is it more than the copies that you have there? There are three copies up here, but oh, there are seven members of the council. No, we gave we, get, we delivered seven copies. Oh, okay. Want All right. To find out where the, Amy may have. Oh, uh, Amy has them. Okay, yes. awesome. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, our staff would probably need a couple copies too. Just send me an email. We can okay. make sure that we're. Okay, thank you. All good. Thanks. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So can I make a motion to forward this to a city council meeting, or do you need uh, verification of the Zion healing before I can do that? Um. Chair Walsh, if I may. Yes. Sorry, I, I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this item was an item for discussion. Um, so I don't necessarily know if there's any action that is required at this point. So yeah, so a motion wouldn't be in order on it then. So wh what would be the, the proper way then to bring it to the full council? Just we, we put it on the council agenda? That Any mayor, council president? Well, I think I heard you say that, uh, I think uh, Council Member Sepadasan was talking about a study session. Um, you know, this, this took a long time for us, mm -hmm. which would be a lot of for a regular council meeting, but, may, uh, but having a study session prior to taking further action might, to see if we even want to move forward. Yeah. And whether it's feasible. The bigger part is, that, is it feasible. Okay. So Deputy two Mayor? council members can ask for a study session? Yes. Okay. And uh, then we would get it on the calendar as soon as possible? So okay. what's the earliest that I could go to? We have to, to ask the city clerk. Okay, because also I know Erica has, has um, expressed urgency with the $100,000. So I don't even know if we have that yet. Okay. Just Do we have the opioid, opioid settlement? I don't know. I don't even know if we have it at the money here yet. Yeah. So We don't, and it's only, what, 58? What was the breakdown? For our, our population, it was 100000 no, but the breakdown of the funds if that would we're that was able to but we didn't have a we we didn't have any we could we don't have a de um designation from where that money would go right it's just, and i just want to make sure that that those funds are allocated toward um exploring helping the opioid problem instead of you know putting it 
in another department sure. where it would just be used for payroll or something. Well, I, I okay. think it's really important that we use it for the purpose that it was intended. And if the if it's the possibility of helping people rehabilitate themselves and become productive members of society, it's only a hundred thousand dollars. It's not that much money. Mm -hmm. And so, it can only be used for my understanding is for um, things that have to do with drug abuse and drug right. treatment. So um, it couldn't go into the general fund just to be mm -hmm. consumed by someone else. Mm -hmm. So are you, Eric, are you okay with uh, having a study session? Is that no, but I'll have to be okay with it, won't I? Okay. <laughs> well, um, let's go, go, go. Yeah. So, um, can we ask if whether or not a study session is? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, you said two people. So here, I'm I'm proposing. So Erica's proposing. I'm I'm supporting that proposal. So Do here's it, the yeah. two people. So we need to yeah. So we need to check with the city clerk and see when we could do that. Okay. 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 So, um, thank you, Lydia. <laughs> so, um, do you need do you need a do we need a motion to move this to or, mm -hmm. or we're just uh, referring it? Nope. Okay, we're good. We'll let you know. All right. Erica. Sounds thank good. Thank you very much. All right. And thank you, AU Consulting. Yes, thank you very much, AU Consulting. Thank you. So, all right, that takes us to the uh, next item on the agenda report on the pack operations and i think that autumn will be able to answer some of the questions that we had clear away earlier i sure well, hope that. i can give me one second here i'm going to exit out of their presentation Good evening, Chair Walsh, Deputy Mayor Honda, Council President Coach Mar, and committee members. Thank you for having me here this evening. Um, for sake of time, I am going to be presenting the entire update this evening, but I do have Brian Hoffman with me if you have any questions in regards to the PAC monthly update. Um, as you found in the packet, the update for tonight's highlights are for November 2022. During November, the PAC had 16 total uses usage days which which included events such as kingston trio native comedy jam the elf movie uh, federal way symphony rehearsals youth symphony rehearsals as well as the king county board of elections greater federal way chamber luncheon ashley house breakfast elenos board meeting and an indigenous fashion show that covered two days unfortunately we did have one reschedule of elo that will be in may of 2023 and then the facility has been without a box office manager and a marketing manager for quite some time. In November, both of those positions were filled and they have since started, which is exciting. You will see the table in front of you compares year over year data from November 2021 to November 2022. You will see that both event days, tickets sold and revenue have increased year over year. Can, can you uh, move the the box there so that we can see what oh I apologize about that oh because we can't see it there we go all right much better thank okay. you so total rehearsal days performing arts rentals pack present series um, youth matinees minor concerts meetings and events um, at this time before I move into the rest of our presentation if you have questions in regards to PAC operations in general myself or Brian can answer those and then I'll move into the rest of the presentation as discussed all right uh, Deputy Mayor Honda thank you what's a minor concert minor concert Brian those are just some of your PAC presents minor concerts correct yeah it, it would be the, based on like the caliber of talent uh, you know whether it's a national high-level artist uh, which they all are um, but uh, so that's kind of just how we categorize it financially so what was a minor concert that was in November of 2022? Uh, November of 2022, the minor concert was... Um, the Native Comedy Jam? Uh, well, you can send it to me. I'm yeah, just, I'm just yeah. curious because it, I, I haven't noticed that category before. All right, Thank anything you. else, Deputy Mayor? um no thanks okay all right go ahead all right 
So moving forward into discussing the grant funding that was brought up earlier during public comment, in November 2022, the last time this committee met, the acceptance of the PAC one-time COVID unmet needs grant in the amount of $50,000 from King County was moved to the consent agenda for the council meeting on November 15th, 2022. The purpose of this funding is to support emergency assistance that will address unmet needs and or lost revenue related to or resulting from COVID-19 pandemic on King County communities. Due to the pandemic and lost revenue, the Performing Arts and Events Center has not had an arts education coordinator or a full arts for youth program since the beginning of 2022. Staff is recommending that this funding be allocated to bring back the arts education coordinator at the PAC and support the arts for youth program. At the council meeting on November 15th, motion did pass to accept the grant, but we were asked to bring forth further discussion both around our recommendation and public comment recommendation, which is what we're bringing forth tonight. The Arts for Youth program at the Performing Arts and Events Center has introduced the magic of live theater to K through 12th grade students since 2017. The student matinees align with and support Washington State Common Core and federal learning standards, and we make those connections clear in our custom materials for educators. Our resources help teachers deepen the learning experience and introduce students to the performing arts. Arts for Youth offers study guides and activity ideas for each show that will enhance students' understanding of the performance and the art form as well as integrate it with other school subjects. We have also created lesson plans at the elementary and middle school and high school levels on the performing arts that educators can use in conjunction with any performance. A guide to arts integration with suggested activities and a sensory friendly pre-visit walkthrough guide round out the variety of materials offered by Arts for Youth. No other facility in South King County presents school day performances and curriculum support of this kind. Pre-show classroom visits and public library events create community engagement and provide options for all types of audiences and year-round programs, ensuring access for all to the performing arts and providing opportunities for the arts to continue to inspire young people. Each season is programmed to reflect our diverse community, the varied stories of U.S. history, and cultures from around the world. Based on low income percentage, qualifying Federal Way public schools receive ticket discounts and bus grants through the Federal Way Performing Arts Foundation. Prior to COVID closures, over 7,900 students attended Arts for Youth programs at the Performing Arts and Events Center. On average, 61% of those students are qualified low income. A majority of students in attendance are from right here in Federal Way. However, we do have students from across King County and Pierce County in attendance over that time. The performing arts play an important role in vibrant commun communities, and for a majority of students, their visit to our theater is their first ever professional live arts performance. Research demonstrates how the arts strengthen intellectual and emotional development, especially for low-income students. Student engagement and teacher surveys attest to their special time here, and we are proud of our work strengthening arts education in the schools. It is our goal to continue to grow arts for youth, enrich local culture, and help students achieve through access to the magic of life performance and arts education. Additionally, the Arts for Youth program came into existence through not only a mission to service youth in our community, but also as a requirement of Section F, Education Outreach of the New Market Tax Credit Requirements. Based on these requirements, the arts education coordinator working on this program needs to be knowledgeable and qualified to write common core curriculum in coordination with each scheduled, scheduled performance. And to discuss a little bit about the resident arts organizations, which is also a recommendation in regards to this grant funding. Um, a public recommendation has been made to utilize this grant to offset costs for resident arts organizations in which the City of Federal Way has current MOUs. The following arts organizations have RAO status at the Performing Arts and Events Center, and those include Federal Way Symphony Orchestra, Jet City's Chorus, the Federal Way Youth Symphony Orchestra, Harmony Kings, and the Federal Way Chorale. Over the past few years, staff has regularly reviewed these MOUs and discussed adjustments to make them more seamless across the board. However, when the pandemic hit in 2020, staff ultimately decided not to make any changes to the RAO status or their MOUs in order to provide consistency through the end of their negotiated term, which is 2024. Over, over the time of the Performing Arts and Events Center being open, the rental rates have not changed. Um, the rental rates are $55 an hour for the resident artist groups in the weekday and $114 per hour on the weekend. Per the resident artist organization agreements, they do have to pay for other charges considering labor, box office fees, facility fees, and production fees. 
However, their rental rates have stayed the same throughout. Um, RAOs receive priority booking of dates and times at the Performing Arts Event Center, have availability to request email blasts at no charge to go out to all of the Performing Arts and Event Center um, contacts, and are able to work directly with the PAC to try and negotiate lower TV, print, radio ad type rates for their advertising. And to not speak on behalf of the resident artist organizations, but throughout meetings and different discussions with them, there has never been an expression of their displeasure with the Performing Arts and Events Center. Both Brian and myself speak with our resident artist organizations regularly, and I would invite them to come speak in front of you and share their personal opinions and what they see they need from the Performing Arts and Events Center. Of these five organizations, three have had regular scheduled programming both pre and post COVID. Um, additionally, of the five, three have received grant funding in the past three years. Highlighted yellow within the spreadsheet show COVID and recovery relief received specifically by these arts organizations through For Culture. You can see highlighted here the three organizations that continue to utilize the PAC, the Federal Way Symphony Orchestra, the Youth Symphony, and the Corral <coughs> have received um, COVID relief funding over the last three years. Additionally, pre-pandemic, right before the closure, we were having conversations with Jet City Chorus and the Harmony Kings. There was a lot of change in their board of directors and there was multiple times that they didn't know if they were going to perform, not necessarily just because of funding or cost, but because they were trying to make sure that their organization was going to stay alive. In conclusion, staff is recommending that this funding be allocated to help bring back our Arts for Youth program, not only because of the amount of students that it serves within Federal Way community, but because of the requirement under our new market tax credits to maintain this program. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. So I have several questions. If you guys have questions and I'm still asking, just tell me and I'll stop. So I thought that the foundation uh, for the PAC was responsible for covering the cost for Arts for Youth. They are not responsible. Since the opening of the building in 2017, the um, PAC operations bus budget has covered um, staffing for the Arts for Youth program as well as additional subsidy. The um, Better Way Performing Arts Foundation does provide somewhere between $27,000 and $32,000 each year to help with that subsidy, but it primarily goes to bus grants and um, student ticket grants for Better Way Public Schools. Interesting. So for the $50,000, you could hire a coordinator for, the, for a year or our anticipation is that we will be able to bring back a coordinator for a year and help with the additional subsidy that typically falls on the PAC operations budget and give us the time since we are back open now fully to increase our revenue to help support that arts education coordinator moving forward. And then you need $50,000 next year to pay for it or more to pay for this position again? Absolutely. but. With our 2023 revenue projections, we don't anticipate that being a problem. The urgent need is that we haven't had the revenues previously to bring that program back. And the schools have remained closed so that when we've been asked to reduce the subsidy, that is a position in a program that has had to remain closed because of the COVID closures. So uh, my concern is with our, um, with our resident art organizations mm -hmm. and to me, $50,000, I'm not sure how many hours um, a coordinator could put in to this program at a salary of $50,000. The arts education coordinator in previous history has always been a part-time position, and that would anticipate being the same moving forward. The position was about 20 hours previously. It would need to be increased to probably closer to 32 based off of the need of the program. Um, however, that would cover that moving forward would the person get benefits that would be something that we would have to ask oakview group because then that would be you need more money for that um i believe you've budgeted fully with benefits and pay correct brian yes so uh, with the resident art organizations are there mou mous pretty much the same all but one is the same Across and the board, the only one that differs from that is the Federal Way Youth Symphony. And how is that different? The Federal Way Youth Symphony, um, when their MOU was put into place, uh, receives, receives complimentary rehearsal one day a week, which if we go back to 
Yeah, I saw that. Since the onset of us providing updates to the council, this is always at the bottom and mm -hmm. has been a, a topic of discussion before. They do receive one day a week of complimentary rehearsal, but that is bare bones, a few chairs on the stage, um, and they are required to be flexible in their rehearsal. There's many times that a show has to be booked and they are moved around and um, the director for this U Symphony is very accommodating in that sense because he's very grateful for the MOU that he's had in place since 2017. In addition, the difference is that they have a 50-50 split in regards to their ticket revenue. They are not charged necessarily a rental rate. They are required to give half of their ticket revenue to the Performing Arts and Events Center to help offset costs. And that revenue can vary from, I mean, if they sell $2,000 in tickets, it's $1,000. If they sell $5,000 in tickets, it's $2,500. Um, but consistently since 2017, the PAC operations budget has been subsidizing the difference that we do not receive from the Youth Symphony. So I, I think it's probably time that we take a look at that. And, Absolutely. Because um, I'd like to support all of the resident art organizations and I want them all to be functioning, alive and thriving. And Agreed. funding has always, from day one, with any art organization is, has always been an issue. Correct. But the, because COVID hit these folks really, really hard, harder than any other group. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to lose these guys. I don't want to lose any of them. So it seems to me that um, unless we can promise that we're going to get some money from our budget in March to give to these groups, I, that this $50,000 what was meant to help with COVID, you know, losses. And these groups certainly did lose during COVID. <clears throat> the, the groups lost, Arts for Youth lost as well. And right. we, we sit in a position, regardless of which direction the council chooses to go, we sit in a position that next year, we will have to find funding to help fund and subsidize the groups again. And even across the MOUs, if we continue to reduce rates or change things, it increases the subsidy that the Performing Arts and Events Center will need to receive from the city. Because that is currently revenue coming in that will need to be offset somehow. And that was gonna be my final statement. That yeah. At the end of the day, yes. this city is still going to need to provide for this coordinator and for these groups. Correct, They're, both are heavily important and which is why it's put on that list for the budget adjustment in the spring to help offset that for their next, their seasons are coming to a close. And so that would give us the timeline to meet with a budget adjustment, talk with you guys in regards to MOUs and then provide the funding for their 23-24 season should the council vote to move forward with that funding. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Council President Kochmar. Well, um, Adam, thank you very much. Yeah, very nice presentation. Um, so I have some questions. What's surprising to me is 2021-2022 revenue is relatively the same, about 50000 per month for 2021-2022, mm -hmm. November. Mm -hmm. So if you extrapolate that out, and I highly doubt that we could because November would be a higher revenue month, so would December, than other months. But um, it, you could look at 600000 in revenue, possibly, for the entire year, I Roughly. would suspect. But your um, expenditures, I believe, are closer to a million per year. For the Across the year, that's yeah. correct. And that has remained consistent since the opening mm -hmm. in 2017. So the, the amount of money that the city, the city is subsidizing you is approximately 4000 400000 per year. Uh, the city subsidy is about 1.1 $1 .1 million um, in 2023, is what was approved in the budget. And but, it'll be just under 900000 in 2024. But is that offset by the revenue? No, the city's subsidy would be about $1.1 $1 .1 million in 2023, plus the revenue equals um, expenditures of about one point eight to keep that building open and functioning. I, you know, the, for me, <laughs> There, it would appear to me that what you would need to do with that building is to reorganize or rethink what you're doing because obviously we can't keep operating at a, a deficit like that. That That's a huge deficit. But w one thing, I mean, the city, this isn't a very, the city isn't that large. Mm -hmm. So w in, so you need to rethink so that we can make this closer to, I mean, we're going to obviously subsidize, but how much is the question? And I, I would think that the more you keep that building open and have more people coming in, maybe at lower rental rates, 
you're going to be better off in the long run, I would assume, I, I would think that you need to look at your operating, uh, your return on investment. So I think you, you need to relook at that. I wouldn't think that a $50,000 expenditure for a part-time person for one year is going to make that much of an impact for you as much as an impact it would be for our arts groups, our resident art groups. It will make a significant impact. Since um, Spectra, now Oakview Group, has come on in 2018, they have obviously we hit a pandemic in 2021, but they were trending to reduce that subsidy and increase revenue with restructuring, which is why we brought them into the city and why we have the contract with them. Obviously the pandemic hit and we're trying to, they are trying to continue that move forward. Okay. But it is not having an arts education coordinator drastically impacts um, the budget. They've had to make cuts through the last couple of years and they were, of all of the city departments or the city buildings, they did the layoffs during COVID. Um, so it does affect us. It does affect our new market tax credits. If we don't have an arts education coordinator and if we don't bring that program back, it's something that we can't report back on um, for the upcoming year. Autumn, at some point, we have to look at what's going on here. I've already asked her report on the PAC, on the community center, not just, you're not the only one, uh -huh, on Demon Space Center and Celebration Park. We need to know how much is ex going out in expenditures and how much is coming in in revenue because mm -hmm. we can't keep off a deficit. So at some point we need to look at this, this Ab whole picture. Absolutely. I'm not on the committee uh, chair, so you need to move forward with whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. So you keep mentioning the new market, yeah. new market tax credits in this program. Mm -hmm. So what happens if this program doesn't come back with the new market tax credits? I don't have a clear answer for you, but I can get with our economic development director and find a clear answer for you and provide it. So on that, with the new market tax credits, I believe we also said we were going to have a kitchen that did the We are supposed to have a culinary program, program which is why in 2020, um, Tim Johnson and I moved forward with Mission Community Nutrition, which I've kept going since Tim's departure in April, in order to um, meet that requirement. Uh, the New Market Tax Credit Investor Board that we report back to, that um, idea was brought to them ahead of time and then has since been reported on and the shows are shared with them. So we are working towards maintaining a culinary program within the New Market Tax Credit requirements. And how long do we need to do this? Uh, we are through 2024. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I personally, I, I think that we need to, to find out just what the impact of the, of whether the impact on the new market tra tax credits on the arts for youth. Uh, you know, I, I think that we, before we can really come to a determination on which way we go, whether it's for the resident art, arts groups or for uh, the arts for youth, um, we need to have an idea of, of what that impact would be, uh, in, in, in my opinion anyway. Um, uh, obviously both of these programs, I mean the resident arts groups and art for youth, I mean they're, they're very, they're, they're important programs. I mm -hmm. mean and, and they're, they're, they're very good programs and worthwhile programs. And so it is, it is difficult. One question that I have is that especially with the arts for youth, it seems like that there should be some other funding sources, other uh, grants, the school district, uh, things like that that would uh, so the school help district the does help support I believe that they put ten thousand dollars towards buses um, for the students throughout the year to help offset some of the um, funding that the Federal Way Performing Arts Foundation provides the Federal Way Performing Arts Foundation and myself actually as their staff liaison we have been applying for grants even through 20 um, through COVID um, a lot of the reason why those grants were we didn't receive those grants is because our program was down and had not been able to be maintained through um, COVID closures. But that is something that prior to COVID closures, they did have additional grant funding come in. It doesn't offset the entire need though, and it is something we continue to work towards. We typically apply for the National Endowment for the Arts, we apply for Fort Culture, um, and many other ones throughout the state and nationally. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Seth Dawson. Yeah, can we ask the school district to step up and maybe do more? One of the big, we could. One of the biggest goals for Arts for Youth was that we were able to take that burden off of the school district. We were able to, of the school district, 61% being 
qualified low income, part of the biggest mission behind Arts for Youth was that we not only provide a live arts performance that a student may have never gotten the opportunity to see, but we incorporate arts education and we take the burden off of the district so they can put those funds to someplace else. It's always been sort of the driving factor for it, but we certainly could ask them to step up. I mean, seeing the benefit maybe, yeah. it would be a good way yeah. to get them involved. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Mary, can, can, I can't see if Lydia has, or Erica, if Erica has any questions or anything. I don't see Yes, that. thank you. Um, so I had a question. Um, so am, am I getting this correct? If, we, if you don't have your part-time, um, did you say it was an arts education coordinator? Arts education coordinator, that's correct. Okay, so if you don't have that part-time person, um, then you're going to lose your tax credits or a portion of your tax credits? I will need to get with our new economic Ooh. development director to find out the full ramification of not meeting that section of our new market tax credit requirements, but I will reach back out with you. Okay, so and what would, do you know what the total amount of the loss would be with the tax credit? I don't. Okay. Because I mean, if it's less than fifty thousand dollars, then <laughs> that's where that's just where my brain's going. Um, I just I'm having a hard time um, because we spend so much money on the pack and that we can't afford. We we really cannot afford two million dollars a year um, or one point eight million dollars a year to squabble over fifty thousand dollars that would keep five groups there, just even if it was just for one more year, to give them that kind of kind of life support for a little while and hope that perhaps things will pick up or we'll find another funding source um, just for right now. Um, things, it, we could find other funding, but right now that $50,000 could go to help so many more people than just one person. Um, it just as as someone who grew up in the arts, it's just really hard for me to uh, to let that go. And I, I don't know how other people on the council feel about it. Um, Can I share I'm, one more tidbit just in regards to timeline? Because I know everybody is of concern that sorry. everything is urgent. No, that's okay. I they are all urgent. Um, I think the biggest thing to really understand timeline wise is that as these resident artist group season comes to a close, we do have a little bit of time before their season starts again in October. However, Arts for Youth has to be planned and the curriculum has to be put together now in order for students to be walking through our doors in September because teachers have to be given all of that information before they leave in June in order to plan for the following okay. school year. So we do have a little bit of a a tight timeline to roll into that in order to meet some of those needs. Um, they both are Im important. They both need to be fought for, which is why we put them on that budget adjustment. But just to provide some insight as to how quickly things need to move for both of them. Okay, I'll, okay. I'll, thank you. Okay. I'll make a, a quick comment and then turn things over to, to uh, Deputy Mayor Honda for just a minute. Uh, you know, this is a, on the agenda, this is an information only item, not not a, an action item tonight. Correct. I, I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to have this discussion for us to open it up and really make sure all of the different aspects were looked at. And then my plan is to be back at FEDRAC with um, an actual um, action item to move a motion forward. Okay. And uh, I think that when that comes, I mean, we need to, to find out the impact on the new market credits also. Absolutely. So when it does come back. Uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. So are you saying uh, that the 50,000 would hire someone to plan programs for the next school year, not this school year? Correct, because this school year is, they're not doing any other field trips towards um, an Arts for Youth program. We are con um, in consistent communication with the school district and they've continued to push off through the through the winter of this year because they were concerned about a COVID flare. They are back on board for next um, school year. So then for the new market tax credits, this year we have not had any of these programs for the youth. And that that is correct. And that we will find out then how the investors feel about that. Correct. Fairly, fairly soon. I, I We are, just to provide transparency, this is obviously our third year without programming, but our first year where we had opening and the district chose to 
not have those programs this year. But this is the first year that we will have to report back that we had the opportunity to be open and we didn't have a program. Okay. Thank right. you. All right. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, uh, next, uh, item D, uh, resolution authorizing the allocation of funds in accordance with the 2022 South King Homeless Partners Housing Capital Fund Development. And Sarah Bridgeford. Thank you, Sarah. Actually. Good evening. Um, uh, this evening I'm going to be presenting the resolution authorizing the allocation of funds in accordance with the 2022 South King County Housing and Homelessness Partners SKIP Housing Capital Fund recommendations. Um, I'm also joined by Dorsal Plants, who is the program coordinator with SKIP. He'll be available if there are questions. You may recognize him. He formerly worked for Fusion and the Family Shelter here in Federal Way. Uh, the policy question will be, should City Council approve the proposed 2022 SKIP Housing Capital Fund recommendation? Um, this is via the resolution. Um, just a little history on SKIP. Uh, SKIP was formed in 2019. Uh, initially, there were a total of nine cities and King County that formed SKIP. Um, since then, we have increased to a total of 11 jurisdictions that you can see on the screen. Um, subsequently, in 2019, RCW 82.14.540 became law, and it allowed jurisdictions to enact a sales tax. Essentially, that was a recapture of existing sales, sales tax, uh, a portion of that sales tax. So there was no increase to the sales tax. Um, the City of Federal Way did enact that tax. And we have access to those funds specifically for the use of affordable housing. And uh, further down the line in 2021, City Council authorized the interlocal agreement for the purpose of pooling uh, sales tax receipts with SKIP. And that interlocal or ILA allows SKIP to establish that capital fund that was included in the formation um, much sooner than we had anticipated with funding becoming available via the sales tax. Uh, that ILA uh, was agreed upon by City Council um, along with other City Councils of SKIP and uh, we are moving forward tonight with the first set of recommendations from that capital fund. In 2022, um, SKIP released the first application for those funds. There were three applications that were received. All three are projects that are located in Burien. The SKIP Advisory Committee reviewed and made recommendations to the SKIP Executive Board. So the advisory is similar to our Human Services Commission. And the Executive Board, um, just as a reminder, is made up of representatives of each city. For the City of Federal Way, Brian Davis is our, um, our board member, and then I serve as the alternate. The SKIP Executive Board agreed with the recommendations and is seeking approval from each jurisdiction. That is a requirement of the ILAs that we come before each council with the funding amount from each city to get that approval. There, these are the three projects. I do have some additional information. It's all included in that memo that um, has become an exhibit of the, uh, of the resolution. The first project is Habitat for Humanity. This is a homeownership project, again, located in Burien. Phase one construction includes 20 three bedroom units. And uh, similar to a lot of their other programs, it is for um, persons or households with incomes below that 50% of the area median income. Uh, the second application is the Mercy Housing Northwest, Burien Family Housing. This is an 89 unit multifamily affordable housing project. They do have multiple or mixed incomes uh, within that project and you'll see that there are set asides for households with disabilities as well as households that are experiencing homelessness. And I, did, I neglected to say the amounts. Um, Habitat for Humanity requested $300,000. They're being recommended to receive $300,000. Not all of that is from the city. I'll show you on a, a later slide the portion that's attributable to the city of Federal Way. 
Mercy Housing requested $1,093,308, and they are recommended to receive that amount. EcoThrive Therian is a homeownership project with 26 houses for um, households with incomes between 30 and 50% of the AMI. And uh, they are not recommended for funding at this time. There are some other reasons, but largely it's a, a timing and feasibility and readiness to move forward at this time. So they may uh, seek funding in the future as well. And on the slide, you'll see the allocation. It is proportionate uh, across the amount of funding available for the cities and the funding recommendations. For the City of Federal Way, that would mean that $50,371.84 would go to the Habitat for Humanity project, and then $183,573.11 would support the Mercy Housing Northwest project. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. All right. Uh, Council President Coach Martin. I'm just wondering, you know, all of these, are, I can see that all of the cities uh, involved with SCIF are, uh, the money is going to two places in Burien. Do we ever, when does our city come up? Yes. Recommendation? Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, part of that will be based on projects that um, come in for applications. Um, the capital stack is very complex for each of these projects, so you'll see things come and go. If this had been a couple years earlier, we might have seen the multi-service center Silver Shadows project, uh, the one that would come in for funding. They're a little bit too late for, for this project. So that's just an example. We would expect and, pro and be tracking the geographical distribution of projects over time. Um, while it is a great investment, I'm just going to go back. Um, if we look at the amount of funding that's listed there, and um, it's not on my slides, but if you go to the memo, um, you can see the, some of the total project costs. And they greatly exceed the amount of funding that we have. Um, we wouldn't expect to see projects in each jurisdiction for each funding cycle. But we will definitely be tracking and making sure that um, there is geographic distribution. Is that fair? Yes. OK. Uh, Council Member uh, Sofa Dawson. Yes, so um, when are these projects going to be completed if if it's approved, and then the nine million or nine no nine thousand that is, and allocated. How, when would that be distributed, or the fifty-four thousand, I should say? Yes. Uh, so the unallocated funds will roll into the next funding cycle. So this will be an annual application. We'll come before you each year with something very similar, and you'll have the opportunity to consider the projects that the Skip Executive Board is recommending. In terms of their timing, I may defer to Dorsal if you have that offhand. Um, is that where it's 2022 and 2024? Is that the? Uh, well, Okay. Yeah. Habitat was uh, breaking ground in 2022 and will complete in 2024. And uh, Mercy Housing has property acquisition accomplished, uh, but is still in the early development phases. That was one of the things both the advisory board and the executive board were very fascinated by is we've got two projects, both at kind of each different ends. Habitat is finishing up for us to come in and help finish. And Mercy House is just getting started, so we can be one of the first people to, to help truly get that started. So Mercy Housing is rental, correct? Uh, correct. And if they don't get the proper permits, then what happens? Or is that guaranteed? Um, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> guarantee it. I'm a very superstitious person. But as I understand it, they have two pathways by which they would be able to get the permitting process established. Um, uh, all three of the projects identified that the, the reason Burien uh, was a place that they could build was the affordable demonstration project that Burien undertook. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Mercy Housing believes that they'll be able to accomplish um, all of their permitting requirement under that. If for whatever reason that falls through, uh, they'll be able to go through uh, a regular permitting process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. and All right. I may add one other component. We hope that these projects move forward anytime that there's a recommendation, similar to projects that we've had with our CDBG capital funds. If it doesn't for some reason, those funds will go back into a pool and come before councils again. No, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the um, pathway to home ownership for sure. So. Um, this is a great, those both are great projects um, to alleviate at least 
um, the issue of affordable housing and addressing also home ownership. So it's they're they're both great, and I I appreciate that uh, Skip has taken this on. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get to Deputy Mayor Honda, I just wanted to, I can't see whether uh, Council Member Norton has her hand up or not. No, she does not. So Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Have the other city councils already approved this? Uh, no, the process is starting. You, you are actually the first. Yay. Um, <laughs> um, partly because of timing, and uh, otherwise we would have been looking at March, and it would fall a little bit too late for uh, the skip board meetings, so we need it before then. So what happens if one of the councils says no, they don't want their portion to go to this? Uh, I believe that there would be a recommend uh, an alteration to the recommendations, and um, that if it would allow the project to continue to move forward, that project could move forward with that lower amount of funding. And there is some funding that's unallocated. It could go back to the skip board and then before councils again for um, additional funding to go to the okay. projects. Thank you. Thanks for uh, all you do. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, with nothing else, do we have a uh, do we have a motion? I move to forward the proposed resolution to the January 17, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And next on to. Oops, hold on just a second here. Item E, the 2023 Diversity Commission Annual Work Plan. Good evening, good evening. Good evening, Committee Chair Walsh, Deputy Mayor Honda, Council President Kochmar, and the rest of the committee. My name is Kia McGlone. I'm the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Analyst. I'm here to represent the Diversity Commission to present their 2023 work plan. The option before you tonight is should the committee approve the proposed 2023 Diversity Commission Annual Work Plan to move to the consent agenda on January 17th. <coughs> the Diversity Commission referenced our city code 2.65 to guide the creation of this draft work plan along with community, active community engagement, community education from September until the current form. Updates you will see start on page 34 in your packet that notes its one year strategic objectives uh, with the commissioners who are 70% new along with myself conducting community listening tours and that could be in a form of community forums along with co-creating an equity tool of some type to assist our city leadership or departments to use to increase equity for either current or future changes that affect our community programs or services needed. The theme you will see throughout this work plan is collaboration, learning, and more learning, but also support adaptability and agile enough to assist both community and staff as needed. The commission also wants to be very intentional with collaborating with everyone inside City Hall and outside and would like to present to city council on a quarterly basis so the city leadership and staff are aware of what commissioners are hearing, seeing, and working on with, the com with community input. And with that, I'd like, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. All right, I, I have a, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, what is meant, hold on, let me get through here. Um, well, one thing that's rather unique is you're wanting to present the city council at least quarter that there's no other commissions that are that are presenting on a quarterly basis to the city council. That's kind of a, a different type uh, request. And is uh, there is there a reason for that, or, or what's the reasoning for that? Uh, the reasoning is to keep city leadership informed. I believe the senior commission. Re uh, presents to city council, if I'm correct. But another alter alternative is to present to this committee, at least on a regular basis, so that you all are aware of exactly what the Diversity Commission is working on and partnering with, 
to just be proactive to help with community services and community needs and just community engagement all together. Okay. And, and what is meant by an equity process toolkit? Yes, great question, thank you. That could be in a form of possibly a checklist, possibly um, a tool that any department, any uh, division or program can utilize to be proactive. Maybe it's regarding community engagement. Um, example for that would be public works department that, are requ that receives Title VI funds and they are required to have active community engagement for their decision-making process. So instead of, um, when you have a tool in place, then you are proactive in devising whatever program or services you're gonna develop versus to create less harm for the community. So that's pretty much, other cities have what you would call an equity toolkit. They may, you may have seen something called a racial equity toolkit. Mm -hmm. It just depends on what the city feels it needs most to help with any kind of development to help with community services or program. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Council Member Seth Dawson. Yeah. Um, actually, I do appreciate the quarterly updates because this is something we, the, the division or your job was created a year ago because we believe in the DI work that the city needs to engage in. So I really appreciate the quarterly uh, update for council as to what is happening and how that is being incorporated into the framework of the city, um, the work that we do, and then how we incorporate our, our community. So I do appreciate that and hopefully um, it continues to happen. Um, how do we find out about the community listening tours and if we, if we wanna participate or if we wanna be there? Sure, community listening tours, um, as I'm the only staff that is managing this work, my goal is to create our, to recreate our website, our city website, and possibly have a calendar so that community, the public, staff, uh, at any time can see exactly what's going to happen month January, month February. And usually community listening tours happen because the community wants it, so possibly it may be with community-based organizations first. It may be with faith-based organizations. Mm -hmm. So being adaptable means listening to the community and providing a space to meet with the community at, at their preference. Thank you, I'll be interested in finding out more about that, so thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Norton. Good evening, thank you for your presentation. Um, please, Forgive me, what is a community listening tour? Uh, when I did my research to look at this, um, like I said, the commission and myself, we mirrored, we studied the city code very closely. And when I reviewed years, met summary minutes with prior diversity commissions, I saw that community tours had already been done. They had been done many, many years ago. And a community listening tour basically means making yourself available. Maybe it's at the library. Maybe it's just saying, hey, let's have a meet and greet so that you know what your diversity commission does, with who is on the commission. Okay. So that's basically just meet and greet. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. And then, did I misread? I don't, I, I don't have it in front of me. And and please forgive me if I'm wrong about this, but did something on there mention uh, taking part in hiring practices with the city? Um, I would wanna look a little closer. Or, or I thought I, I saw something about like hiring contractors and, or something like that, sub, you know, when, for example, when they're going to clean up camps and stuff that you would wanna have a part in hiring the cleanup company or something. The, the, Was I wrong about that? I don't, I can't find that exactly, Council okay. Member Norton, but the commission is very clear that their role is to advise and make recommendations. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Seth Dawson, did you have another? I do, but I've already oh, okay. asked. So All right, uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. Um, so 
a community listening tour. I was on the diversity commission when we started those. And what we did was for one of our um, listening tours, we gathered senior citizens together and at the community center and we had a lunch for them and we um, had interpreters that were there to translate for those who's, who um, had a difficult t time with English or didn't speak English very well. And we talked about what their concerns were, what we could do to help them in the community. We had quite a good turnout because it was during one of their lunch programs anyway. And we actually had to order more food. But then um, I've been to a community listening tour at the library since I've been on council. And there were only three people that came, uh, myself, another council member, and my husband. So if this is going to start up again. There needs to be a focus on, on who you're going to to meet with and and win and uh, work really hard to get people there because it is difficult unless you have like the luncheon. You know, we knew that there would be people there, that seniors would be there. Uh, we did have more seniors come than we expected, which was good, but that was probably the most successful one that the diverse Diversity Commission had done. So um, I did have a question on part of your work plan, and I'll let uh, Council Member Sefa Dawson go while I'm searching for the skin. But thanks. Okay. Um, my question is around the subcommittees. Yes. So there's 14 of them, and we have how many commission members? Nine. Nine. Correct. So. Are you able, are they able to, to accomplish all these as subcommittees? Uh, the subcommittee listing is what has mm -hmm. been done in the past and uh -huh. possibly the future. And it was written to make, to just pretty much give a historical aspect of it. Um, with each year as the years progress, so this listing is not meant to say in 2023, there are going to be 15, 20 projects. And so, this was something that was devised to just show that um, if things happen, if the community requested, the commissioners would create a subcommittee to help focus on that. So it doesn't necessarily mean all these are being done and right. or, okay, thank you. All right, just a uh, question on the community listening tours. One, one thing that with the diversity commission, uh, I think that there needs to be attention to, to greater diversity. I mean, the, the single largest uh, uh, minority group in the city is the Hispanic community, and there's no uh, um, that there's no uh, uh, body of Hispanic uh, origin on the diversity committee, and uh, another significant uh, uh, minority is the, is the Slavic community and and also the uh, the Asian community. And specifically, the Korean community, and I, I think that there needs to be attention sent to some of these other uh, diverse uh, communities. Uh, with that, so I, I appreciate appreciate your point, and I agree with you. And I think that will be part of my job, intentionally as staff, to be more intentional with my engagement with those targeted groups. Okay. But it has not uh, been something I haven't been trying, so I will keep yeah. trying. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. So in more, most commission work plans, there's actually a calendar, like the first quarter this will be done, second quarter this will be done, third quarter this will be done. I don't see that on here. And my concern with that is that there's a lot on here. There is a, a lot of things that the commission wants to do which is awesome but i don't see the timing and i think the timing is important enough that if the commission's let's say in, in uh, quarter one they're going to have one community listening tour and that doesn't happen then they're they, they need to make that happen then because then in, maybe quarter two they're going to do it again in quarter three so some I, I think this would 
look better and be, for me as a council member, if it was, if you could maybe take this back to the commission and say, so in quarter one, this is what we're trying to accomplish, and in quarter two, this is what we're going to accomplish. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Because right now, it, it's a, there's so much on here, uh, and I, I, um, I would be concerned that some of this could be overlooked because there's, there's just not the timing as to when it's part, when, when you think it'll be accomplished by the commission. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, I mean, that definitely makes sense to, to, to me, yeah. Because we, uh, with most commission work plans, there is a, more of a timeline on it. Do you want to have that brought back with the change made, or do you want to adopt it as is with the, with the assumption that the change will be made? Um, my suggestion would be that it would go back to have the changes made before we adopt it. Okay, I. I but wanna... I'm not on the, I'm not on this committee, okay. so I don't vote. So. <laughs> uh, Uh, Erica, Lydia, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? So you, ha you had started to answer that. Yes, I, I wanted to just stress that throughout the, throughout the work plan, uh, it's noted that this is a live document, and it's noted that there could be changes. This is actually four pages. The previous work plan was five pages, and so this is actually shorter and a little bit more direct, meaning there's actually a one-year strategy plan on page your page 34. And so with DEIA work, it is excellent to have a timeline and a projection of something being done. But as I've done this job for 10 months now, I have yet to have contact with someone from um, Latinx or Hispanic background, not because I haven't tried, but because it hasn't been successful. So. We would like to definitely have as much engagement, successful engagement, active engagement as possible. But um, with the quarterly reports that we give council, you guys would know exactly where we are in our process. And if we have to adjust and pivot our work plan or our community engagement efforts in any capacity, we're willing to do that. But that's hard to predict, like you said, Susan, having a successful active engagement even with the advertisement that I have put out there and reached out, I probably sent hundreds of emails to the same organizations to just have a meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. And we've been, I was on the diversity commission for several years and we had the same issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I completely understand. Mm -hmm. Council Member Norton. I'm speaking to the uh, lack of engagement with certain communities, those communities are very closed. Mm. Um, and I've had trouble getting responses from them as well. Um, and, and it's just their cultures. It's how they operate. They stay to themselves. And it's it's not easy to penetrate that wall. Um, it, it's it's <sighs> It's really hard to, to make that expectation, I think, for them, um, or to, or ex excuse me, to set that expectation that they recruit people from those communities when they're they're really not willing, for the most part, to do that. Um, and the only reason why I know that is because most of my employees at my former business are from the Latinx uh, communities. And it, it took a really long time to gain their trust um, but I have a little bit more of an understanding of how they work and, and their mentality. And um, if you don't speak Espanol as your first language, it, it's hard for them to trust. Um, and then about the, the working plan, you know, this is my first year. Um, I actually, I think this is my second year reviewing this. Um, but I don't really see, uh, DEI as something that, yeah you can set goals of, and please excuse my dogs. They're, they're outside barking. If you can hear them, I apologize. Um, I don't see DEI as something that 
necessarily you can set goals for certain quarters of things happening because of the population of people that we're talking about. Um, things are things change and, and we're talking about human beings then you know that change is constant so i mean i don't know i mean i i really don't have an opinion on that um so if i will defer to uh council member Asefa dawson about um what deputy mayor honda brought up um with the with the set schedule for the group Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, Councilmember Norton. So when I when I said that, I realized that things may not happen in quarter one, but at least it gives the commission they know that they're they're to be working on this in this quarter and this in that quarter. Like, um, you know, they know that they would be working on the MLK celebration most okay, of the year. Okay, I get but, you know, it. But oh, I get it. So okay, do you, okay. I it, it's not yeah. that. You know, and if something doesn't happen, then that's okay, but um, at least they know what they're working on each quarter. I got it. Okay, thanks that's for all. explaining. Okay, well then, put it on a schedule then. How's that? Put your, you know, itemize itemize your uh, your statement. <laughs> that's, that's about the best I could do. And like I said, if uh, Council Member Asefa Dawson wants to formalize that, and make a motion please go ahead and i'll second it and if you don't then that's good with me too i i believe can't answer that question really so i am okay with the way i personally am okay with the way it is but as things happen i think when you give us the quarterly update then you will tell us what has taken place i think that would cover um that part and, and initially, that was my concern also when I saw how many subcommittees there were. It's like, how do you have nine people doing 14 things? But if they're split up in, uh, somehow in some formation, then I, I, it works. And we understand how, when some of these activities are, like Flavor Federal Way and or the Dr. Martin Luther King, and you know when these things happen. So I think we're good. Um, but as far as um, reaching out to the Latinx communities, I think and I don't know if you've talked to uh, El Centro de la Raza to see if they wanna partner because I think they have a captive audience there. And once they understand the importance of being part of leader government entity and how it would benefit them, I think it might be good sell, but it looks like you've already done that. So I'm not gonna push the we idea. Also, <laughs> just to let you guys know, we actually have a an applicant from that community, but um, due to agenda setting, our interviews wasn't included in that because I think you guys had a pretty packed schedule of interviews already for other commissions, and I understand that as well. So knowing that it's a volunteer position and knowing that people come and go as they want, I try to be very mindful of that. Councilman Hunt. Have you invited that applicant to come and attend meeting, meetings? all the time do they come D does she no oh, that's unfortunate yeah <laughs> all right D do we have a motion before i make a motion is it okay um i think it looks like kia signed the um the director approval um spot is that okay can we go ahead and overlook it or what i don't that's not my signature oh it's not that's okay. keith nevin's signature Oh, so you're, you're not in the mayor's office anymore? I, I am, but that's uh, okay. Director Keith Nivens. Okay. That's his signature. Yeah, he is a director. Yeah, yeah. so any director. Okay, I don't know how this works, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I was expecting Brian Davis's initials or signature, so. Brian was on leave, so Keith stepped that in. That makes thank sense. You. All right, thank you. That answers my question. Okay. I move to forward the proposed 2023 Diversity Commission an annual work plan to the January 17th 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next. Item F, Valley Narcotics Enforcement Team and 
Uh, Chief Sumter. Good evening, Council. It is my pleasure to be here tonight to speak for the Police Department. We come seeking advice or direction on two public safety questions. The first one is, should the city and the Federal Way Police Department maintain a relationship with and renew an agreement with the United States Department of Justice Drug Enforcement Administration to continue our efforts that interrupt trafficking of narcotics and dangerous drugs in South King County, including Federal Way. As you may know, the United States Drug Abuse Act of 1988 established a program called High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas, or HIDTA, HIDTA. According to the, DT, uh, the DEA's website today, in the United States, Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands, there are 33 HIDTA program areas. South King County, Washington is one of them. To the feds, this is the Seattle Enforcement Group D22 Task Force. Locally, here among Valley Cities, we call it the Valley Narcotics Enforcement Team, or VNA. <laughs> so you will see all of those acronyms in the packet before you. Participants in this task force include one officer or detective from each of Auburn, Federal Way, and we have been part of this federal task force since 2010, Kent, Renton, Seattle, Tequila, Washington State Patrol, and three agents from DEA. Signing the agreement allows us to continue our regional and federal partnership. It allows us to get reimbursed for our officers' overtime, and it allows us to receive a share of monetary assets seized through task force investigations. And that would be effective now through the end of September 2026. Any questions? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the work you do. When you talk about um, getting a portion of the whatever is seized from these drug raids, how much, can you just give us a roundabout figure about how much the, the City of Federal Way has, you know, when, it, when we go into something like this, what we get back out of it? We receive, there's that number of participants that I just articulated. Mm -hmm. The DEA takes 20%, and then the remaining 80% is split among the municipalities. And that means we get about 11.4% of what is, what the judge finally decides is transferable. Now, if you want a dollar amount, how much a year do we get through participating in this task force? It varies greatly. On a busy year, it's over a half a million dollars. And we don't have busy years often, especially in the last few years, but it's over $100,000 every year. So this could be the judge could seize a house or a yes. car? Cash. Yes. All right. Um, well, thank you. And, uh, you know, there, um, I think it was two weeks ago in Burien, there was a huge raid. Uh, were we involved in that? I don't know that our officer was there, so I don't know if that was the DEA okay. task force or not. I, I don't think it was. That was something else. Okay, thank you. Council President. Okay, thank you very much, Deputy Chief. Appreciate uh, your uh, report. So what do we do with the money that we receive? I'm just curious. We spend it on things that have a nexus to drug uh, drugs, okay. right. and that's a variety of things. It buys, it pays for SWAT equipment for one thing. It pays for uh, a, a wide variety of things, but there needs to be a connexus to drugs. Sure, uh, I thought that. And also, Deputy Chief, um, do we have a problem with human trafficking as well as trafficking in drugs? That does occur here, yes. Yeah, and do we have, what happens to the people the, whether they're children, male or female, or adults that are Victims traf of trafficking? Victims, yeah. Where, what happens to them? Well, we try to connect them with services. Uh, this is a, a little, I'm about to go off topic for the question tonight, mm -hmm. trafficking humans and, and a DEA task force. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that in the recent decade, maybe more, that law enforcement efforts across the nation have not focused on the victim who is trafficked, who we used to refer to as the seller, mm -hmm. but instead the buyer. And we, instead of jailing 
a person who is prostituted, we now offer them services and try to connect them with services that will help get them out of that lifestyle. Yeah. I'm just worried about that because, you know, with the immigrants coming across the border. Right. Um, and, They're uh, vulnerable to that. Oh, yep. absolutely. And, and how many are going to end up in this area? And how are we going to help them? That, that would be a real concern right. for me. But thank you. That's an issue. Yeah. Yes. Councilmember Sepadasan. This is a curious question. I know you were here when, um, during the very first presentation. Is, could this money be used for something like that, for instance, if we need to I suppose offset? it could be. Okay. There's definitely a drug nexus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Excellent question, Council Member. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. I just have one more. How in our budget, how is this documented? this money that comes in from seized cars, houses, whatever money? It's not part of the general fund. Right. So it's not a line item in the budget. It sits in a pile, and when there is a drug-related request for expenditure, for instance, if the SWAT team needs a new armored vehicle, it's very expensive. And it prevents us from coming here to council and saying, may we please have $200,000 to go buy a toy truck? And you would reel at that request, and it would, it would very, be very harsh to hear, and the presentation would sound good to me, but to the rest of the community, they would say, oh, come on. It pays for things like that. Oh, I understand that. I'm just oh. wondering how it's documented. How it's documented? Well, there is, it's tracked by the finance department, and okay. there, it is line itemed. It just isn't, uh, okay. and you could look it up. I don't know what the number is okay. right now, but. Okay. I, I was just wondering. That's, it's definitely it's documented, documented by yeah. finance. Okay. Yes, okay. they that's, track that's all. all of it. And I'm, I, I'm glad that you, it's there, useful, and yeah. getting things that you guys need to be safe and to do your job, but I was just right. wondering how it's documented. By finance. All right. I, that, I, to, to me, this is a critical, critical agreement, and and thank you for your your presentation. And uh, do no other questions. Do we have a motion? Sure. I moved forward the proposed agreement to the January 17, 2023 Council Consent Agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. With no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 It is unanimous. All right, and item G, that is also you. The second topic that we seek policy direction from the council on tonight regards our downtown substation. This is the one located across the street from the transit center. As you know, we have been inside that facility since 2014 and we have been in a lease there since 2015. So our question is, the most recent lease expired at the end of December, 10 days ago. Should the city renew a lease with Bally Road LLC for the Federal Way Police substation and increase rent to $3,700 a month? Utilities are included, so there's no additional costs. You may be aware that our traffic section is housed there as their primary office facility. We can also use that substation as a base of operations when there is a public safety incident at or near the transit center. Being high visibility in that particular location, we also hope it adds crime prevention value to the area. Now, the term of the proposed lease is now through the end of 2024. And you heard me say already that the agreement, the most recent lease, expired 10 days ago, at the end of December. So if the decision is not approved to renew, then we will promptly pack up and move out of the facility. Deputy Mayor. Was this in the budget? Um, was this allocated for in the budget? It was allocated at $3,000 a month. Okay, thanks. So they raised it to $3,700? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Councilmember Seth Dawson? Yeah, so that was my question. So the 700 a month is something that needs to be found somewhere else, right? Yeah, for now, we will, if it's approved, we'll find it out of our regular budget. But this does come to $16,800 over the term of the lease, over two years. We may come at a budget adjustment mid-budget stream to ask for a few more dollars. Um, so I, I believe being there and being visible, I think, helps 
reduce crime at the, at the transit center. We hope so. so. <laughs> right? Um, if this doesn't get approved, right? Is there even space to come for, 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 off, for, um, for the traffic section? To come back to City Hall. It's getting crowded downstairs, okay. thanks to a very supportive city council. <laughs> That's great news that it's getting crowded downstairs in the police department. We, we would, of course, find room for them. Okay. They want to be out riding their motorcycles, but they also need office space. Thank you. Uh, just a question for you. Um, uh, I, I believe that Tom Cantrell has been donating space also, correct? Is what's the, uh, how helpful has that been? and, and what, it, what things this are? particular space mm -hmm. was donated for 2014. We've been in a monetary agreement since 2015. But, but, but with uh, Tom, Tom Cantrell's space. Oh, the, the other site yeah. on Pacific Highway South. Yeah. Yes, that is donated. Uh huh. Okay. Has it been very helpful? Is there anything very. housed there? Or, or very. Any? You, as you drive by, you might see a lot of police cars parked there. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. it gets a lot of use. Police officers have converted a large portion of it to an exercise facility, and, and that draws the police in. They can drop in, get a quick workout in, get back on the road. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, did you have another question, Council Member Seth Dawson? Okay. I don't. All right. Uh, do we have a motion? Yes. I move to forward the proposed lease agreement to the January 17, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 It is unanimous. Thank you very much, Thank Chief. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, H, Global Kitchen DBAK Catering. Good evening, council members and committee members. It's nice to see you. Um, I would ask for a little bit of forgiveness as I'm quite nervous being up here in front of you for the first time. My name is David Clements and I am the manager of the Duma Space Center. Uh, this evening, I'm asking that you would forward the new I, I, I will just interrupt say you, you should be very nervous because we're very intimidating. I can tell. So. <laughs> I've been watching you all evening. <laughs> um, I would like to ask that you uh, move the agreement for Global Kitchen, which we uh, affectionately refer to them as Cake Catering, uh, to the meeting next week for approval. We are currently contracted with Cake Catering, and this new agreement would supersede it. Uh, the reason that I'm asking for a new agreement essentially is to remove our customers from being her customer and to make Duma Space Center or myself her customer, uh, <coughs> to regain control over the ordering process, to streamline the process for our customers uh, and just offer better customer service and uh, service in general. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you, I think that's an excellent idea as we had some issues with the council retreat and the meals that we were trying to, to get set up. Um, with, uh, with her catering, I was surprised that when we tried to have a lunch menu, we were only offered one item that we could order. Everyone had to have the same item. And a lot of caterers will let you do more than one item because that one item might not, I could guarantee you wouldn't please everybody. Is that typical of what you're, you find with caterers nowadays? To a certain degree, yes. Uh, I will say Duma Space history, I'm still learning a lot of, uh, but it has been our history to provide a singular item per group. Whether that's right or wrong, I can't say, but it is something that I would like to explore changing, uh, at least to a certain degree. There's an element of price that we have to take into consideration uh, to make it cost effective for the caterer, for Dumas Bay. Uh, but there's also, I believe, a minimum that could be ordered. And as long as something is over a minimum, there certainly should be a variety. 
Okay, thank you. And thank you for staying so long tonight. Normally these don't go this long, so <laughs> no, thank you this. so much. Yes, all right. Any other questions? Do we have a, uh, a motion? Yes. I move to forward the proposed agreement to the January 17, 2023 Recreo Council meeting <laughs> consent agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 It is unanimous. Thank you very much. I hope you weren't too terribly intimidated. Thank you very much. Right. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Nice meeting you. <laughs> and the final item on the agenda, item I, Parks and Recreation Commission 2023 Work Plan, Jason Gerwin. Uh, bat and clean up for you guys tonight, and um, <laughs> we'll have a little bit more informative presentation than I did last night. Uh, with that being said, uh, the policy question before you tonight is should the City Council approve the 2023 Parks and Recreation Commission work plan? Uh, you have a copy of the work plan there in your packet. I can tell you uh, a couple items on that work plan that I'm super excited about are uh, the master planning of Brook Lake and the master planning of Steel Lake. Uh, both items have been on our work plan for at least four years and uh, the status was when funding became available. Uh, thanks for this budget process. Those funds were available to do those studies and uh, excited for those. Uh, with that being said, I would entertain any questions. Right. This, this is what a work plan generally would look like, so thank you. Uh, I try. I've done it a few times. I know. <laughs> um, well, and the Diversity Commission is such a different commission than, than other commissions, so I, I get that. So you'll do a, a master plan that's just the plan that's not actually uh doing what the plan says oh no 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 no, no, no. no. So, this is just giving getting and soliciting the community input and the, the community telling us how they want to see these parks future developed as you know steel lake park is uh well loved and uh, uh loved so hard that it needs uh some infusion i mean the parking lot is over 30 years old uh there's not yeah. much saving it and so um, changes are coming, changes need to occur. And so, yeah, this is just to provide the roadmap for how we would spend future dollars to make those improvements. Are there grants out there to improve parks if that, we came up with some really, you know? There are grants uh, available. Uh, the problem that we have is staffing issues in the Parks Department. Uh, since the downturn in the economy in 2008, we have been without a what was traditionally called a park planner. It was something that we had asked for in this budget cycle. Uh, we kind of refer mm -hmm. to it as a park planner. And uh, we feel there's a misnomer when you talk park planner that all they do is sit at a desk and draw up new parks to build. And, and that's exactly not what they do. They, they more fall in line with what we would consider or call a capital projects manager. And um, those duties uh, when after uh, the position was released, um, have fallen on the deputy director and the parks manager ever since. And um, I can tell you it's a struggle to keep up uh, with all we have. And, and so uh, you'll see that in the next budget request to, to add a, a capital project manager or that because um, our ability to manage these large scale projects as other duties is assigned isn't viable. I agree and I agree that this is a position that we really need here in the city, so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We appreciate greatly what the uh, Parks Commission and the Parks Department does. So yeah, Parks Department and Parks Commission appreciate your ongoing support. It's it's definitely known and seen. All right. I'm ready. Go ahead. <laughs> I move to forward the proposed approval of the 2023 Parks and Recreation Commission work plan to the January 17, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. And now, if all of the presentations had gone that quickly tonight, we would have been out here a couple of hours ago. So, okay. <laughs> all right. Go first next time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. And that concludes uh, our business. Any other business? Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. I, I would like to ask that we get a report on um, revenue and expenditures for whether we get it by email or whether we get it in a, a committee meeting. 
on um, Performing Arts Center, on uh, Community Center for last year, for the um, Dima Space Center and Celebration Park, Revenue and Expense. And the Target Building. <laughs> and the Target. Thank you. Just I've asked, I'll I've interject. Asked for that has been asked for. And we have agreed to do that at the February committee meeting. February. Okay. It, what, Celebration Park was not in the. Okay. Uh, Is that right? In the first, we can still do it. Okay. But it was be really helpful. it was the PAC, mm -hmm. Dumas Bay, the Federal Community Center, and now we'll add also uh, we can add Celebration Park. You know, and that really is uh, important, the Celebration Park, so that we can go and say, hey, this is really important, very well used, and this is why we need to get funding from federal or state. And I agree 100%. this is the reason why. So we we can save on our operating revenues by having. Turf fields, for example. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned. Good night, Erica. Oh. Good night, Erica. Good night, Erica. Good night. Have a good night. You too. Good night. Bye-bye.